I see four so far. There's Karen. Alex, can you also bring in the public? So um, I did, but Norm seems to be stuck and he's our only public. He's joining. Okay. I don't know that that, yeah. Yeah, I just clicked submit as well and he is joining. Lots of excitement in the opening here, so I'll wait for him. I'd hate to start having to read this over again. What are we waiting for? We have one member of the public who should be joining the meeting. He's in the waiting room, but might have some technical difficulties. Got it. Oh, there he is. Are we talking about Norm? Yeah, I think you can start, Paul. His name's been there the whole time. Oh. I don't see it on my screen, but that's okay. He's in the waiting room, according to what I've got. And I didn't... Well, oh, just, now he's gone. He just bounced. He was there. I didn't see him at first, so something's up. We had him in the waiting room, and he has now left the meeting. Uh, I, he hasn't signed up to speak on this item, so John, up to you if you're comfortable with us proceeding. Yes, as long as he's not trying to get in the meeting, we, I'm comfortable proceeding. If he's dropped off, then there's no need to okay. delay. All right. I would like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of January the 10th, 2022. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. May I have a roll call? Council Member Fair. Here. Council Member Pearson. Here. Council Member Uring. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Grisanti? Here. You have a question. Do, do we have any public speakers on the closed session item? Let me double check to confirm. And no, you do not have any speakers I, on the I second. see Norm in the audience. Is he a speaker? He has not signed up to speak on the closed session, and I don't see any raised hands from the public. Okay. We will now recess to the closed session to discuss the item listed on the closed session agenda. We will reconvene at 6.30 p.m. to begin the regular session and hear the closed session report. Okay, everybody leave and re-enter.
Okay. I'll apologize for being the last one back. I'd like to call the order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of January 10th, 2022. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during the meeting, please raise your hands electronically, and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. May I have a roll call? Councilmember Fair? Here. Councilmember Pearson? Here. Councilmember Ewing? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Grisanti? Here. You have a quorum. I hope you'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of, of the United, United States, States of America, of America and, and to the Republic, to the Republic for which, which it stands. stands one, one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty and justice, and justice for, for all. all. Mr. Cotty, may I have a closed session report? You may, Mayor Grisanti, members of the council, good evening. The council did meet in closed session tonight pursuant to government code section 5496.9D. The council authorized the school separation committee to make a counteroffer to the, the Santa Monica Unified School District amounting to $40 million over 10 years in targeted funds to six Title I schools in the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District and to continue to work with the district to identify acceptable, acceptable mediators in the hopes of mediating before the county committee votes in March. That concludes my report. Okay, may I have an approval of the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. I'll second it. I have a first, uh, a, move, a motion and a second to approve the agenda. May I have a roll? Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. May I have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on December 30th, 2021, with the amended agenda posted on January 3rd, 2022. Thank you. Uh, it looks like we have a ceremonial presentation. Item number one is community vision for Malibu Unified School District. And I think we'll be hearing from Christine Wood. Are you available, Christine? Yes, Mayor Grisanti, thank you. Um, so council and community, we are presenting the final results of the community visioning work that the school separation ad hoc committee has done in an effort to um, really flush out and um, identify what the vision for the Malibu Unified School District um, is based on community input. We did this work with the um, help of two visioning consultants, Judy, um, Dr. Judy Chasen and um, Holly Preby Sotello, um, who are here with us today to do this presentation. I will briefly just let you know um, that Holly has had um, three decades of practical social work experience. Um, she has done curriculum development on topics including school crisis response, threat assessment, school bullying and harassment, child abuse, human trafficking, diversity and anti-bias, um, intergroup relations and mediation, teen dating, um, just it goes on and on and on. Um, she's currently a clinical associate professor of field education at the University of Southern California and their School of Social Work. Um, and she has earned credentials in educational 
administrative services, pupil personnel services, dispute resolution and conflict resolution, human trafficking, and child abuse and family violence. Dr. Chasen is a national expert on issues related to um, bullying and human relation and gender identity. Um, she works extensively with principals, teachers, students, and community members to build school-wide protective factors and increase school engagement and student success. Um, and she has received her PhD from Claremont Graduate University with a focus in educational urban leadership. Um, she, again, is a national expert on creating public schools that are affirming of sexual and gender diversity. So um, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Chasen and um, Ms. Sotelo, and then I will, um, I will chime in if necessary as they explain the findings of our visioning work. Um, are Holly and Judy here? Yes, here we are. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you for inviting us to join you tonight. My name is Holly Previ Sotelo, and my colleague here is also Dr. Judy Chasen. Um, thank you, Christine, again, for inviting us and the council members. Uh, Judy and I were contracted by the city of Malibu to gather community voices regarding the proposal for a Malibu Unified School District. We have prepared a brief presentation for you tonight, and so please stop us at any moment uh, to interrupt if you should have any questions or comments. Next slide. So in this 10 minute brief presentation, we will give you an overview of the different strategies we use to collect people's voices, opinions about the proposal for a Malibu school district, as well as our observations. Next slide. Um, so we utilize three different strategies to gather the voices of the community. Um, one of them was the online survey in which we had 517 respondents. We had listening sessions um, in which there were 88 participants and a visioning work group, which was 35 participants. Um, and all of these occurred between October 28th and November 20th, 2021. Next slide. Uh, so the online survey, next slide. Thank you. Um, so we had 517 respondents um, in English and in Spanish. And um, the questions that they were queried on was their beliefs and their opinion about the proposed separation, their characteristics of a successful school district, which we call the pillars of success and demographic information. Next slide. Um, jumping ahead to probably the most important point that people are interested in, which is what were people's attitudes and beliefs. What we found was that 91.3% of the respondents of the online survey were in favor of the establishment of an independent Malibu Unified School District. And as you see, the number undecided and opposed was equal as 4.3%. Next slide. So of those 43.4.3% who were opposed, that's 22 respondents, um, the reasons that they gave for being opposed were they were worried that Malibu may not have adequate financial resources. There was a little distrust in leadership, whether the city is prepared to run a school district. And thirdly, was a desire for a more diverse community. Next slide. Of those who were uncertain, Primarily, that came down to they just really wanted to see what the what the curriculum was going to look like before they made a, um, a position on this. Next slide. Thank you. And so the reasons why people were supportive was um, a, a number of reasons, and they were quite um, were quite verbose about this. The strongest one was that people really believed that schools should be governed. Um, locally and be responsive, responsive to the communities that they serve. So they really wanted this local control and accountability. Um, inequity and um, people felt that schools in Santa Monica were better maintained and better resourced in Mal than those in Malibu. That did not feel equitable to the respondents. There has been a lot of a lot of conversation about feeling that really maligned and neglected by the Santa Monica Malibu School District in its current construct. 
Um, other people felt that these two communities are very different. They're very disconnected and very distinct. Disconnected geographically, um, as you well know, the distance between Malibu and Santa Monica, particularly during peak hour, can be quite su substantial um, and distinct. Um, some, a lot of the respondents saw Malibu as a semi-rural community and saw Santa Monica as an urban community. And interestingly, um, they also wanted a desire for more diversity. I don't know if you noticed, but that the desire for more diversity was the same reason that was given by people who were opposed. So that's kind of interesting that we see that this is a shared value. What differed is people's um, beliefs in how to go about um, achieving um, greater diversity in the schools. But at least on that core point, they actually were in alignment. Um, next slide. Next slide was our listening sessions. And um, so here we facilitated seven affinity group listening sessions, one session which uh, was held exclusively in Spanish. The others had translation available. We also had um, other sessions with parents of children with exceptional needs. We had parents with of, of private school children and business community. And we also were fortunate enough to have um, students in the, Malibu, you know, uh, in the Malibu School District. Next slide. Next, we hosted visioning work group. Next slide. So our visioning work group was our culminating activity. Their task was to, was to take these findings and draft a value statement a mission statement and to operationalize what people felt were the attributes of a successful school district. And those pillars of success were school leadership, school culture, school programs, and student success. Next slide. So these were our key findings and takeaways from the listening sessions, online surveys, and visioning team. Judy, next slide. Thank you. Um, so what you saw very briefly in the data that we showed you is that participants in the listening sessions and the online surveys were overwhelmingly and enthusiastically in support of an independent Malibu Unified School District. They, they could support the schools um, by through volunteerism, leveraging resources, tapping into their personal networks. They had amazing and exciting visions about what this school could look like. And your community is very devoted to doing whatever they can to make that happen. Uh, so I know that was that was quick. We ran through a lot of information very, very briefly. Um, any questions, comments, um, anything that we can clarify? I see a member of the public. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Rosemary Sampson. Yes, uh, my question to you is, when you did these surveys, I'm assuming that they were specifically directed towards parents or parents with children of school age. Is that correct? Um, the, the, in the listening sessions, we did have um, specific sessions that were for parents of school age children about 60% of our respondents were parents of elementary school children. Um, the online survey was available to everybody. And yes, we did, um, the, we did not do the outreach, the city did the outreach and really made a lot of effort to capture as many voices as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. I don't see any questions from the council. I thank you for this work you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We're sorry to have kept you waiting. No problem. Takes a lot of work to run a city. We understand. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Council. I believe that brings us to item 2A, written and oral communications from the public. So do we have any communications from the public concerning matters which are not on the agenda, but for which the city council has subject matter jurisdiction? City council may not act on these matters except to refer the matters to staff or schedule the items for a future agenda. 
Do we have any public speakers? Yes, we have 13 speakers tonight, so I'll read their names a few at a time so people can get ready. The first few speakers are Kelly Walton, Bill Sampson, Joe Drummond, and Don Schmitz. I don't see Kelly Walton in the meeting yet, so we'll hear from Bill Sampson first and circle back. Hi, Bill, are you in the meeting? Here. I witnessed the December 13th meeting. I addressed what I felt were the honorable council members. I would limit that to Bruce and Steve. The other three of you demonstrated a lack of character and a lack of integrity in your attacks on Mr. Silverstein. I didn't expect much, frankly, from Karen, who greeted me a week after the fire. The first thing she said wasn't how your family was, but how gleeful she was that motels were about to be installed in my neighborhood. I expect less than nothing, frankly, from Mr. Rosati. Mikey, you were the disappointment. I had some hopes for you. Instead, you spoke of unverified allegations made against Bruce in another jurisdiction as to which he was exonerated. You know, lawyers lose cases. I don't think Bruce's firm did well in that. That happens. We can, sometimes we can't beat our clients. We take cases, things go wrong, you lose. Nevertheless, you brought up a whole bunch of stuff to vilify his character with no foundation whatsoever. I happened to notice you did nothing of the same with regard to Mr. Grisanti, which could have been done. I will refrain from that tonight. I've written you, you know what I'm talking about. I would suggest, given that demonstration, that you, all those attacks you made on Bruce for no reason whatsoever, you paid out a third of a million dollars of my money to Ms. Feldman. Why? Because Bruce did something to her? Well, what did he do? There's a report out there. You've been sitting on it. Instead, with no basis whatsoever, you simply attacked him personally and at length. It was a disgusting display. It indicates you lack the character and integrity to hold the offices that you hold. You should all forthwith resign. I think you did this simply to prevent Bruce from becoming the mayor. That's simply wrong. More people voted for him in the last election than anyone, and I view your attacks on him as an attack on us. You want to deprive us of our representation. That's not how government's supposed to work. I will say this, if the report is made public and it shows that Bruce, in fact, sexually harassed Reba Feldman, I'll be first in line to ask Bruce to resign. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Our next speaker, we have Joe Drummond, followed by Don Schmitz and Georgia Goldfarb. Okay, Joe, are you available? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Honorable Mayor Grisanti and City Council. Again, after the last council meeting and slanderous comments against mainly council member Silverstein, I'd like to ask, did we not all pay for an investigation into his conduct and supposed allegations of harassment of Reva Feldman? What were the results of this investigation? Having council members make a judgment on him regarding the Wagner affidavit on these issues between him and the former city manager is inappropriate if an investigation has already been completed. If the investigation exonerates him, then there's nothing more to be said, frankly. When will the results be released? Also, if accusations against another council member are unfounded and not based on any proof, they should be withdrawn. Council should also waive confidentiality respecting the substance of the discussions in the closed sessions from January through May that addressed Reva Feldman's threat of litigation. This would truly be transparent than on decisions made with our funds. I have heard that public records requests regarding this are not being given. In the California Constitution, Article 1, Section 3B1, it states, the people have the right of access of information concerning the conduct of the people's business, and therefore the meeting of public bodies and the writings of public officials and agencies shall be open to public scrutiny. Hopefully you've all learned from this experience and can work together 
civilly from now on for the benefit of we residents. I know that is your ultimate goal, and the only way to get there is by being united towards this, despite any differences in opinions. If this report cannot be released automatically, I hope that it can be put to a vote positively for this to be released at the next meeting. On a different subject, our family, among many others, are finding many faults in the planning department and their lack of knowledge on the codes and following them and making residents with small projects like myself wait and not come close to any approvals. The planning department needs a major cleanup to run efficiently. Too many large-scale environmentally damaging projects are being approved in Malibu, while small projects like my 69-square-foot deck, which should be exempt from permits, are being dragged on for over a year, not to mention all the fire rebuild delays which are happening. The codes need to be interpreted clearly for the sake of our residents and followed, and variances should not be given out so regularly and also only require for projects adding more square footage in hazardous areas, for example. They need to be carefully considered and not given for large additions and new builds in landslide areas where other properties are affected. I hope City Council can make it a priority to make the planning department follow the codes and streamline it so it functions properly and maintains the Malibu vision and mission statement. The Malibu vision and mission statement should also be something recited at every City Council and Commission hearing and meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Who do we have next? Our next speaker is Don Schmitz, followed by Georgia Goldfarb and John Mazza. Don, are you available? I am, Mayor Grisanti. Before you start the clock, I have three PowerPoint slides. Thank you. It's up there. Uh, uh, so far away. This is Don Schmitz, no pun intended. I'm here as the president for the Coalition for Fire Safe Communities, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, I've sent a packet to each one of you council members. And I uh, just want to touch on it very briefly this evening. Next slide, please. Uh, it has been brought to my attention. We researched this by uh, in conversations I've had with John Mazza, who uh, signed a letter uh, with me and uh, was sent to the council today. That the city of Laguna Beach is availing itself of uh, significant state funds to create fire breaks to protect their community. They're backed up to the north from the uh, 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 from the mountains, uh, just as we are, uh, which uh, the winter and fires drive down out of those mountains and in, into their community, create tremendous damage, just like Malibu. Next slide, please. So we've designed a system of wet defensible fire breaks. They're not proposing the sprinkler system that CFSC is in Laguna Beach, but we've designed a system that we've outlined for the Santa Monica Mountains to protect our communities, to protect our Malibu. And we believe that state funding is available for these fire breaks to be constructed and implemented and perhaps the fire sprinkler system as well. Next slide, please. So uh, we've mapped these out into critical ridge lines. The fire department knows exactly where these fire breaks need to be. Uh, they rush around in the middle of the night with bulldozers anytime a wildfire breaks out to cut those fire breaks in. And we think that those ought to be pre-positioned to protect our communities. Next slide, please. Obviously something that would be very uh, aggressive and beyond the reach of Malibu would be a system for the entire Santa Monica Mountains with six water tanks holding 9.5 million gallons of water and 84 miles of water line. It will work. This has been vetted with some of the best fire safety experts in the state of California. Next slide, please. That being said, council members, the ball's in your court. Uh, I've uh, done presentations, we've spoke to you about this in the past, and now the state of California is giving out money to communities like ours in the class four fire zones. We think you ought to get very active on this and see what can be done to take a robust approach to protect Malibu from future wildfires. Uh, with that, I appreciate your time and I'm available for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Schmitz. Our next speaker is Georgia Goldfarb, followed by John Mazza and Olivia Jolly. Georgia, are you available? Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, great, thank you. Good evening, council members and mayor. I urge you to release the results of the investigation and evaluation regarding council member Silverstein and former city manager Feldman. There were many contentious exchanges on this matter and strong opinions among the public. We have paid for the investigation and we would like to know the outcome. Since Councilman Silverstein stated that all communications were in writing and no action was taken against him, as, as I understand this, I assume that he was exonerated. However, 
I think it is important to clear the air on the interactions and the conversations and not hide behind the proverbial smoke and mirrors. There's great merit in truth and reconciliation. We all know this. It is a healing process where truth is known. I think we all deserve to know as much as possible what the truth is. Again, please release these findings. It will help the city and citizenry to move forward in a more positive vein. On another matter regarding fire breaks, which was just brought up, there is absolutely no science demonstrating that fire breaks help in the chaparral. In fact, there is abundant evidence that they do not work, and I would be happy to provide you with that and all the experts. All you're doing is creating a greater fire hazard, which will be filled with fire accelerants, non-native grasses. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Our next speaker is John Mazza, followed by Olivia Jolly and Rosemary Ide. John, are you available? Yes, if you can hear me, I'm available. Um, we can hear you. Okay, this morning, Governor Newsom announced $1.2 billion this year for fire safety. And we don't have any of it. Now, uh, it's a strange bedfellow between Don and I. Uh, I, have, I. I have a house in Laguna. I've watched them proceed to underground and are surrounding the whole city with fire bricks. They do work. I've been in two fires. I've been in a lot of fires, but two fires that literally the only reason my house didn't burn down was I was there with a shovel in one case and a hose in another. So we have to be proactive. Sirens don't work. If you went to the uh, Public Safety Commission, the experts said they didn't. We, and we need to do something. We can't sit here three years after a big fire and do nothing. Don's plan involves fire breaks. I don't know a huge amount about sprinklers or anything else. I'm not part of his organization, but I give him major kudos for giving it a try. And we need to support things like this. Now, the other thing, public safety is important for a city. The other thing is public trust. In a year, you're going to have a new mayor. Well, in a month, you're going to have a new mayor. You're going to have a new city manager in a month or two. You're going to have a new city council within a year. And what's missing in our government is trust. The people do not trust you. And part of the reason is this hiding of information, not being clear with the public. You need to release the Silverstein report once and for all, let the citizens know what's going on. Uh, without a, a citizenry that trusts you, you're always going to have fights. You're always going to have people uh, double is guessing you. You're always going to have a certain population wondering where their money's going. And it's a lot of money is being spent. And it's the same thing with the school district. We need to know what's going on. You get a 10 minute report every once in a while. Fine. Uh, but it is very, very important for you to release the Silverstein report and clear that up, get it over with, and move on. Move on with a new mayor, move on, move on with a new city manager. And I, I make the point that it is not fair to bring a city manager in here in the mess we're in right now. It's They need to start fresh with a clean slate and the public trust, or at least have to earn it but not start in a deficit. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Our next speaker is Olivia Jolly, followed by Rosemary Ide and Ann Payne. Olivia, are you available? Yes, this is Olivia. Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm joining and my neighbor, Kelly Walton, who didn't make the call, we have the same issue to cover. Um, she's expecting a baby and due any moment. So. That might be why she's not um, joining the call tonight, but we're both very interested in reducing the use of gas powered leaf blowers in the community. And we want to encourage additional patrols and enforcement of this issue. 
Um, so really want to come to the council to seek your support in gaining that additional coverage. Um, we did get some coverage today, which was terrific, and it definitely makes a difference um, just in terms of the noise, the pollution, their health related problems with the use of these gas blowers. So um, we really just wanted to speak to that and solicit for additional uh, support in forcing um, those not being used in Malibu. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker is Rosemary Ide, followed by Ann Payne and Jamie Francis Wendell. Rosemary, are you available? Yes, I am. Am I on? You are. Oh, I can okay. hear you. Hello, everybody. Hello. And I'd just like to make some comments regarding the report um, about Bruce Silverstein and Reva Feldman. It was paid for by the people of Malibu. And I think they have a right to know and see it and know what's in it. Where is the transparency? I really urge you to open it up for public viewing. And then whatever happens, we can make up our own mind. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Rosemary. Our next speaker is Ann Payne, followed by Jamie Francis Wendell and Rosemary Sampson. Hi, Ann. Are you available? I can hear you, but... We can hear you. You can? Yes. Thank you. I am speaking on behalf of my family. Uh, John Payne owns the computer, therefore his name is on it. But I'm using it with the help of some nice staff people at City Hall. Thank you. I'm very concerned about the amount of debris that came down Malibu Creek and practically devastated the bridge that we all worked so hard to have in our canyon. And this is not our first flood nor our first cleanup. But I think the evidence this time showed an increase in volume of water, expanse of water in the creek, erosion has begun again. And there's a concern in our canyon that upstream contributors, entities such as some of the COG cities with whom the city of Malibu works need to be advised that their debris is not our debris. We paid and had men working to keep our road and bridge clean and, and open for emergency reasons. I appreciated that uh, Steve Earing came by and checked on us and saw what a mess it was. Paul Grisanti checked in on us. That was great. Tonight, I'm asking you to go beyond that. The city council has, I, I understand from some of the water experts or former postal commissioners and uh, people who have been active in the community a long time have said that we have a city lobbyist. I did not know that. Rusty Arreas, former head of the state parks, would be a great person to get state parks to clean up their stuff. We had logs, trash, and big things that needed big equipment. Four or five men and my husband worked with a bumper of a gardener's truck and straps to get the huge logs dislodged. The debris has increased. This is not going to be our last storm. The erosion has increased. I'm asking you to notify the COG members, the county and state agencies, and We've already talked to people at the um, um, net, um, <laughs> plundering for words here. We've talked to people uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers and know that there are things that can be done with a proper permit to reduce the sediment that has built up under the bridge that we have here 
There are other bridges and other storm drains in the city. That's your time. Okay. Graham. Thank you. Please notify. Our next speaker is Jamie Francis Wendell, followed by Rosemary Sampson and Lonnie Gordon. Jamie, are you available? Hello there, Council. My name is Jamie Francis Wendell, and I'm calling because I want to say finally, the City Council has to pass this housing element resolution. I've been engaged and involved for the last 10 years, 10 plus years since 2011. There have been four iterations of City Council in the City of Malibu before this has actually come to fruition. Um, I've been wanting to move and live in Malibu because of access to cleaner air quality. I have severe asthma, I have fibromyalgia, and I have chronic fatigue and pre-existing conditions that I need cleaner air quality and a safer environment to live in. And I feel that that has been prevented. Um, the city of Malibu has had a reduction in population since the Woolsey fire. Um, and you see that there is no affordability that if you go on sites, it shows that the city of Malibu has zero affordable housing. Oh, I don't understand the concept and feasibility when you have a metro station access to places, people who should be living in a beachfront community should be of all incomes, not just multimillionaires and Airbnb that allow jet set travelers to be in your city. How ridiculous is that, where you only represent people who are non-residents, who are multimillionaires? That, and I've been living in this county, and I was priced out of the city of Santa Monica. And I want to be on the west side, that I should be able to get access to the ocean air, and not just millionaires. I have physical limitations, and, and I want to be in a nice community that's safe, doesn't have crime and has good air quality. Why should I have to fight for that? I should be able to as a 41 year old, but no, do I have to be a millionaire who's in their twenties who can be in Airbnbs and jet set? What are they doing and offering to your community? Nothing. And then the state has no way to enforce this. And the city is not finding ways to finally pass this ordinance. Why have I wasted 10 years of my life? For what? What does that show to me? What does that allow me, someone who has been engaged, who has actually gone before three city councils beforehand, and now with COVID, everything could be swept under the rug, passed over. People were, were caused to leave that city because of the fire, and they had their mansions burned down. It just shows you. What about people who want to live in an apartment off the Pacific Coast Highway? That should entitle me to be in your community as well, and I shouldn't have to fight. What do I have to go before the state? What do I have to go before the legislature? I mean, what do I have to do? Do I have to pursue this legally? It is not fair to someone like me. Jamie. And now it's my time. time. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. I'm sorry, our next speaker is Rosemary Sampson, followed by Lonnie Gordon and Ryan. Rosemary, are you available? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Councillor Sterra, Pearson, and Grisanti, I want to remind you of the saying that those who live in glass houses should not throw stones. I want to remind you of the premise upon which the people of this city expected and still expect our elected officials to abide by. Accordingly, we find it in the Malibu Municipal Code, Section 1702030, the vision statement and the mission statement of the citizenry of this city. The vision statement says, Malibu is a unique land and marine environment and residential community whose citizens have historically evidenced a commitment to sacrifice urban and suburban conveniences in order to protect the environment and lifestyle and to preserve unaltered natural resources and rural characteristics. The people of Malibu are a responsible custodian of the area's natural resources for present and future generations. The mission statement says, 
Malibu is committed to ensure the physical and biological integrity of its environment through the development of land use programs and decisions to protect the public and the private health, safety, and general welfare. Malibu will plan to preserve its natural and cultural resources, which include the ocean, marine life, tide pools, beaches, creeks, canyons, hills, mountains, bridges, views, wildlife and plant life, open spaces, archaeological, paleontological, and historic sites, as well as other resources that contribute to Malibu's special natural and resource settings. Malibu will maintain its rural character by establishing programs and policies that avoid suburbanization and commercialization of natural and cultural resources. Malibu will gradually recycle areas of deteriorated commercial development that detract from the public benefit or deteriorate the public values of its natural, cultural, and rural resources. Malibu will provide passive, coastal dependent and resource dependent visitors serving recreational opportunities at proper times, places and manners that remain subordinate to their natural, cultural and rural settings and which are consistent with the fragility of the natural resources of the area, the proximity of the access to residential uses, the need to protect the privacy of property owners, the aesthetic values of the area and the capacity of the area to sustain particular levels of use. Look into your conscience and your heart. Have you lost your way? Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Our next speaker is Lonnie Gordon, followed by Ryan. Lonnie, are you available? Trying. There we go. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Good. Good evening, Council. I'm I'm talking specifically tonight about releasing the report that was filed by Reva Feldman against Bruce Silverstein. Um, or Silverstein, I'm sorry. <laughs> I always think of young Frankenstein and young Frankenstein. <laughs> um, it's very important to us, the community, because we paid for this that this investigation be released. Unless there is some reason that the three council majority do not want to release this, um, we need to know what that is. John Cotty has said that it's up to the council to release it. And we would like that release so we know what's going on. Um, that's my main point tonight. I have other points that I would like to bring up and I will tomorrow night in the planning department about uh, agreements that have been made um, on the hotel and the motel that are going in that are not following code. And I'm not sure what's happening with the planning department and why they're doing what they're doing, but I think there needs to some, be some investigation regarding that as well. Um, we, the community support Bruce and Steve, and we want to know what's going on. So that's that's it. I appreciate your help tonight. I appreciate your listening to me. And I will be back with the 5G soon because we want to finish this ordinance and get it done. It's still up in the air and not finished. Thank you so much. Take Thank care. you, Lonnie. Bye. Our next speaker is Ryan, and then we'll see if we can circle back. Ryan, are you available? Yes, I am. I wanted to um, address certain issues, but I guess people are bringing up other ones I might comment on also. I think the city needs to work on hiring an efficiency expert. Um, I got over the warrant register and I'll, look, I'll speak to that later, but the uh, cost benefits is a ongoing analysis that's really incumbent on lo local governments and the smaller the government, the more important that is. Your warrant registration, your, reg your warrant register tonight is massive. And as I said, I'll speak to it under time for that uh, coming up right after. I'd like to find out um, how the cash flow of the city is working because the warrant register has some red flags about that. What is the delinquency of rent or deferred rent or subsidies of rent? 
going out to the properties that the city owns and has tenant occupied. Um, that's an issue. Um, the public subsidy programs of other cities uh, for COVID relief and so forth are ending. And there generally was a litmus test as to a need-based thing as to whether or not there should be any type of public assistance provided in that. Um, but this seems to be going on for a while. Um, the other is uh, at your meeting in December, um, we heard from a, well, I think it was November 30th, maybe, I can't recall, but we heard from the recruiter that you guys hired and everybody I talked to said that the guy sounded like he was drunk. And you can like hear barware glasses clattering in between the public comments. You paid him $5,500, and I sure hope he picks a winner for you guys. You didn't come out of a closed session uh, last month with a uh, um, what seemed like a, a confident um, time to announce a new city manager. So it tells me two things are, are wacky. One is you can't agree on somebody, or there's some deficiency in the written contract you couldn't approve it that night. But either way, that leads me to the speculation. And the worst is I want to close with at the December 13th meeting, th there was a, a, a terrible display of a council majority of sour grapes, political power struggle. Um, you dug up uh, issues from 10 years ago and tried to slander a sitting council member who was elected with the most votes and scheduled to become mayor. And it was pretty evident as to what you're up to. You asked him a year ago to prove himself um, as to why he should not be mayor then. And in the last year, he has proved himself. And what you've not done is proved yourselves about the allegations of that report. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Or Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Uh, yes, I was going to circle back. I still don't see Kelly Walton in the meeting, and we don't have any raised hands from the public. So that concludes public comment. Thank you so much. I believe that lands us at... Item number 2B, which is Commission Committee City Manager Updates and uh, hopefully a report from the Sheriff's Office as well. Do we have any kit Commission or Committee Updates? No, you don't have any Commissioners or Committee Members signed up tonight. Okay, is Steve McClary, will you be kind enough to give us a City Manager Update? Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, uh, and Happy New Year. Um, First wanted to go over, uh, it's, it's been about a month since we met. Of course, during that time, we had a very significant uh, rainstorm that came in right before the Christmas holiday. Uh, we fared pretty well, uh, despite um, the intense amount of rainfall that we received that day. Uh, many of us around here were hard pressed to recall last time that we received greater than five inches of rain in the immediate area in a 24 hour period. So uh, obviously, uh, good news for the, the the general environment and for water supplies uh, but it did lead to some small issues in the city uh, had some small slides and whatnot um, and in fact we're still dealing with um, some aftermath of it we had a, a slide just a couple of days ago that affected uh, gas line here in the city um, so i just wanted to uh, thank uh, the public works staff and the staff with the environmental services department uh, for their responses during that day and for the public works crew being out uh, at night uh, over the holiday period, making sure that uh, streets were clear of debris and, and mud uh, and keeping everybody safe. So uh, thank you for that. Um, obviously, as we turned uh, the calendar to the new year, uh, we received the gift of a rather uh, a significant surge of um, COVID uh, with a rather significant increase in cases being reported, uh, obviously, across the nation, uh, the state, and also in the county of Los Angeles. Uh, last week, uh, I haven't seen the, seen the latest numbers, but uh, the test positivity rate was uh, inching up somewhere to as high as uh, one in four persons being tested. Uh, so obviously due to the very, very high rate of uh, community transmission occurring, and also due to uh, some impacts of illnesses to um, employees here in City Hall, uh, and the concern with getting additional pers persons ill, both staff and members of the public, 
uh, we made the difficult decision of closing City Hall and city facilities uh, to the public uh, at this point through January 28th. Uh, we picked a date a bit far out uh, just to give some certainty to the public, uh, but with the idea that if we begin to see uh, the numbers turn around that we could look at resuming some service. So again, nothing that we did lightly. We know it impacts service and the ability for people to come in and get what they need at City Hall. Uh, we are continuing with our regular inspection schedule uh, so that we can continue moving forward uh, with those key projects, in, including the fire rebuild. So I uh, appreciate the public's uh, patience as, as we work through this uh, difficult time, uh, and we hope to be uh, back open as soon as possible. Um, last week, uh, staff uh, had really a, a kickoff initial meeting uh, with staff from the LA County Sheriff's Department to talk about plans for the Malibu Police Station. Of course, as you well know, there are plans to include the new station as part of the college that is being built. Uh, and they expect to have the shell of that uh, completed sometime uh, towards the end of 2022. Uh, so this will be looking at a series of meetings with the Sheriff's Department staff uh, to talk about how uh, for options for funding uh, for, um, excuse me, for staffing that facility. Uh, and obviously that the cost that would be associated with that. Um, my understanding is that uh, there is desire to, uh, or there has been expressed in the past that the city would be uh, looking to do some outreach with uh, members of the uh, community as we look at uh, different uh, staffing level scenarios uh, for the Malibu station. Obviously, that's going to have a significant impact on the budget moving forward. Um, so again, we this was just our initial meeting to get things going, uh, but we will be looking to expand this out to uh, include public engagement. Uh, I would also like uh, to throw out there at this point that perhaps the city council uh, consider appointing on an ad hoc committee uh, to work with the staff as we work with the sheriff's department to look at these uh, various um, different scenarios uh, for staffing of the station. Uh, obviously, we uh, our staff is very eager to see uh, what is coming out in the governor's proposed budget uh, for next fiscal year that was released this morning. And we're beginning to look into the details on that. Uh, the uh, analyst's office is projecting a 31 billion surplus. The governor's office is projecting higher than that. Uh, we will be seeing what funds we might be able to acquire as part of the programs being advanced by the governor, particularly for uh, wildfire management. Um, so we, we will be looking closely into that. Um, wanted to mention that the uh, city staff will be scheduling a meeting with the Big Rock um, Homeowners Association. Um, we were waiting to get past the holidays uh, for a time to convenient for the HOA. Uh, but our public, our public works director informs me that uh, we'll, they will be setting that meeting up soon. Um, also, we are working on uh, preparations for the mid-year budget that will be coming to city council at your next meeting on January 24th. Uh, prior to that, um, the mid-year budget projections will be presented to the administration and finance committee. Uh, that committee is meeting this Wednesday at 2 p.m. Um, also wanted to note and thank the uh, public speaker regarding the um, concerns about gas blowers. Uh, yes, they are prohibited in the community. And we would encourage any persons who um, see or witness this activity uh, to please contact code enforcement as soon as possible at 456-2489 at extension 484. And we'll see what we can do to get out there and respond to that. And then lastly, for my report, I wanted to note uh, that I have the uh, Pleasure of announcing that I have appointed uh, Ruth Quinto. Uh, she will be serving as the interim assistant city manager. Um, Ruth has a uh, stellar background and I'm very pleased to uh, introduce her here to uh, the city council. Of course, she is not a stranger uh, to uh, council or the community. She is currently serving as the city's treasurer. Uh, Ruth has a, um, among the many things that she's done in her career, um, she served as the chief financial officer and deputy superintendent for the Fresno Unified School District, uh, where she was instrumental uh, in their financial turnaround. 
Uh, she also served uh, four years for, at the city of Fresno as their controller and also served time uh, with the city of Moreno Valley. Uh, she holds a number of awards uh, and honors, including being named the 2020 uh, Most 100 Notable Women in the state of California by the League of Women Voters. Um, and of course, with the, uh, with, with the welcome, warm welcome that we are giving to Ruth, unfortunately, we also have to say our, our goodbyes uh, to Lisa Soger, our current uh, Assistant City Manager. Uh, Lisa, it's been a pleasure of mine to work with you uh, these past eight months. Um, your dedication to the job, um, your dedication to the employees, your ability to uh, connect with the staff as well as the public uh, is amazing. Uh, you certainly made my job easier and I think probably, I think that's probably true for almost everybody uh, who is in this room here at this moment. Uh, so Lisa, just on my behalf, I'd like to thank you for everything that you've done with the city. Uh, and I'd like to ask if you would like to have a moment to uh, to speak to the, the council and the community. Thank you, Lisa. Certainly, thank you, Steve. Um, I, I just wanna say that I appreciate uh, the, the opportunity I've had to serve this community for the past five and a half years. Um, and working with a truly outstanding staff in City Hall. Um, we have become a family um, over the, these past years. Um, and I, I hope I've done everything I can possible um, in this short time I've had remaining. Um, I'm proud to say we submitted our annual comprehensive financial report on time to the GFOA last week. So that uh, closes out the past fiscal year. Um, we have also um, won, I think we put out an announcement, we won a budget award. We didn't think we were going to, we just sort of threw it in, hoping to get comments for future improvements and GFOA awarded the city an outstanding budget report for the current fiscal year budget. And finally, we were able to put out today uh, the mid-year budget for the administration and finance subcommittee. So I hope I've like moved the ball down the field as far as I could. And I know that Ruthie and the rest of the finance staff, Renee Nierman, Joni Hand, um, Brenda Cho and Leah Tucker, in addition to our fantastic um, assistant to the city manager, um, Elizabeth Shavelson, will be able to pick that ball up and take you through the rest of this fiscal year. And uh, the ANF subcommittee will see on, on Wednesday, my last day, I'm spending it with you guys, um, just how well we are doing in this economic recovery. It is quite impressive. So I'm happy to be able to leave on good news, knowing that um, the budget for this year is in very good shape. Um, and, I, and I just want to point out to all of you, um, you have tremendous people in City Hall. This staff works incredibly hard. I have been side by side with them in the EOC through multiple disasters, whether it's fire or flood or pandemic. And two a one, they are dedicated to serving this community. And I hope I find that where I go next. I don't know that I will because they really are special and they have made my job just that much easier. Um, it truly is an honor working with them every day. And they know I'm here for them if they ever need me. So I will just say that as a shout out to all of them on the call and not on the call, call tonight. Um, but it really, I'm, it's very bittersweet to leave. I, um, I'm looking forward to a new challenge, but I will miss all of them greatly. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I see Mikey's hand is raised has been for a while. I think I tried to clap for Lisa and I accidentally pushed the wrong button because they look kind of the same, but either way. Um, well, I, you know, I just want to say thank you to Lisa as well publicly. Um, it's been amazing working with you. You're an amazing professional and um, thank you so much for everything. And I'm happy for your shorter commute going forward, but not happy for 
for us. But at the same time, welcome Ruthie, super excited. And Ruthie is a Malibu resident as well, which I know a lot of the community really loves. So, uh, and yes, I, I read your resume again today and it's just mind blowing actually. So we're very honored and blessed to have you here. So thank you very much. Um, other than that, my comments today, since we've been on break, are all basically related to the speakers. Um, number one, the report. Uh, there's some misinformation out there. We have not tried to block the report going out. That's not that's not what happened um, at all. I wanted the report out from day one, and I'm making a motion right now and hoping to get consensus that we uh, vote on releasing the HR report. That I'll was, second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I just think we need a nod of heads maybe to to, to get to that, but um, I, I don't... absolutely that report should come out. In my opinion, we should vote on it. And yes, I know there might be issues and I know there yeah, could be stuff like that, but I'd like to see if there's consensus on that. And Mayor Pearson, right. just, to be, just to be clear, this is not an agendized item, so it would have I, to be to well, come back. So it would well, have to come back. Great. Yes, I appreciate that, John. I understand that. Okay, I'll second it in that form. Well, and if there's consensus, is there a third nod on there? I don't have any problem nodding to it, but it's it's going to be on the next meeting then. I, well aware. I know how it works. I got that okay. wired. But okay, so I, I hope that, yeah, of course, of, co of course, we want everything in public, and everything transparent. And some of the things that have been printed and are said are they're just wrong. You just don't actually know what's going on, to be honest. Not in a don't mean to mean that in a bad way. It's just we all sit in different places and see different things. So I'm glad that we can get a, a vote on releasing that. Um, Don, I want to address you directly on the sprinkler system. Of course, I know all about it from several years ago when you showed it to us. I'm glad to talk with you more about it offline. Um, I do have some questions and concerns on it in a number of ways, but um, more than glad as always to discuss that with you. Um, anything to do with fire safety, I'm willing to discuss at pretty much any single time. Um, to Ann Payne, um, yeah, the debris flow was, was mind blowing from this rainstorm. Um, Ann and I talked yesterday, um, Malibu West had a massive debris flow. And where did it all come from? It came from the Trancas Creek watershed upstream. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure what can be done about it, but it, it actually smashed our, one of our, our big flood control dam in half. Um, just obliterated it and left a massive, well, put a lot of stuff out into the ocean, including huge rocks and debris. So, and Malibu Creek, I saw the, the dam overflowing. Yeah, mind blowing. I think what worries me, and I've kind of said this in relationship to the sand at Westwood Beach, and probably this will just be an ongoing theme, is storms look to be getting maybe less frequent, but bigger. That seems to be a pattern of climate change. And that seems to be what we're seeing here. Um, so yes, whatever we could do as far as dealing with upstream debris, you're, you're right on. And, and I don't know the answer, I'll be honest. I don't know the answer right now. Lots of jurisdictions involved, um, and I'm not sure what else, but uh, I am certainly glad. I, and I think your idea of talking to uh, Rusty at Cal Strat, of having our group that um, I think that's Paul and Bruce that are doing that, I think is a great idea. Talking with the COG is a great idea. Yeah, because that was a, a lot of debris, a lot of damaging debris. Um Jamie on affordable housing. I've heard you speak before. Um, you're not you're not wrong. It's it's a tricky issue, tricky world. I don't have all the answers. Um, we have actually have tried to pass our housing element. It's been returned for 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 more detail, or it's been returned by oh my gosh, is it HCD or uh, the state anyhow to be for more definition. Um, affordable housing, super tricky issue and very tricky in a city like ours. Um, and 
as you may or may not have heard, Jamie and anyone else that's interested, yeah, we there is a huge lack of affordable housing here. We're aware of it, especially for people who work here as well and live here. Um, it's just almost impossible. So definitely an issue and definitely state mandates are really, really have the potential to change our ability um, to govern some of these issues. So we have to be very strategic and very clever going forward um, in order to find the right balance. So I, I think it's going to be a, a big issue as we move forward. Um, as far as the city manager search, it has taken too long, indeed, longer than any of us wanted. Um, some stuff was outside of our control for sure. There's no fist fights and at these meetings, anything like that. We're all working together. Um, it has taken longer. I don't know when we'll have more news, but I'm hoping it's very, very soon. Um, can't remember who mentioned leaf blowers. They are illegal already. And actually, you'll be glad to know, um, I think it was, who was it? Anyhow, whoever mentioned leaf blowers, the state is banning them soon. And I, I'm a little unsure which year, but I think it's 24. It could be 2023. Um, our neighborhood is the same problem. Here's, here's the thing I see is that most people who have leaf blowers, gas powered leaf blowers being used on their property have no idea. They don't realize the gardeners or landscapers they've hired are using them. That's even happened in my neighborhood with the president of the HOA and other people. They had no idea. They're at work all day. So um, I think what we're trying to do in our neighborhood is just when it's someone sees it, report it to we have an HOA, which helps, and 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 also to the homeowner and let them know. And you'll be shocked. And most of them are, are completely caught a car. They had no idea. Um, I like the idea of an ad hoc, um, Steve, on dealing with the sheriff station. That makes sense. And um, one, one last comment, back to Jamie on affordable housing. It's related or not related. The city has worked really hard to maintain its rural nature. And when the city was formed, a lot of people got together and set up how that would look. Zoning, our ordinances, working with Coastal Commission, et cetera. It appears now that the way we're doing things pretty much only allows the very rich to develop in Malibu. That's how I feel. There's exceptions such as in my neighborhood, but still I wouldn't call it affordable housing. So um, I think this is gonna be a very, very tricky and uh, tricky issue that this council and next council is gonna have to deal with because like I said, the state is passing bills that um, are ordinances and laws that we have to abide by that are gonna make our ability to control our land use is more and more difficult. So those are my comments for tonight and thank you to all the speakers. Hey, Mikey, I, I'm afraid I jumped the gun a little bit. Is Lieutenant Braden still in the room? Kelsey, is he there? I'm checking now, but no, I don't see him. Okay, if he comes in, could you let me know, please? We'll keep an eye out. Okay, Steve, you're up. All right. Uh, first, I'd like to say Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, it, it's 2022 hopes will be better than 2021. At least that's the, the plan I've got. Uh, Lisa, we're going to miss you. You're going to miss us. All right. I'm, and I'm sorry to see you leave. It's been a joy working with you. I wish you the very best. I think about us every now and then. All right, and just for the heck of it. Uh, the, the, the rainfall that, that Steve mentioned, uh, and I want to give an acknowledgement to one of our staff, Mark Johnson, uh, one of the, the Sycamore Farms, which is off of Cross Creek Road, uh, got flooded out uh, as a result of the rain. There was a holding pond on the La Paz property that broke. Some have flooded out the property, and Mark Johnson spent the day of, you know, his day off at Sycamore Farms, helping them pump out the water and make it better. 
uh, and, and Sam, who runs Sycamore Farms, could not have spoken more highly for the effort this gentleman put into that. So I want to thank him and the city, Steve, and I guess Yolanda, everybody who sort of helped us deal with that issue because it was a real mess there for a couple of hours. Uh, Mikey, I agree. Let's let's get that report out and get it uh, approved so we can release it. I'd also like to go back to, to Joe Drummond's comment. I'd like to see us figure out some way to take some other information that's been done in closed session and make it public. Uh, you know, for example, and, and Steve, John, you gotta, I got, I'm gonna be careful how I explain this. If I say something I'm not supposed to be saying, you can shut me down. My finger's on the button. Okay, good man. Uh, <clears throat> there were other discussions we had in our closed session that dealt with this harassment issue. And we got some information. And I'd like to have that information made public because I think it displays the kind of discussions we've had. And I think it says something about the decision making that we're doing. So, Mike, Mikey, if you would agree uh, to add to your request that we take some of the information we got from the lawyers during our closed session sessions on this harassment issue and make that public, I'd like to vote for that. So you think about that one. I mean, if look, I don't, I don't have a problem with any of it. Cool. Okay. Then, John, if you could add that to your list of things to may bring back, I would appreciate that. Uh, and last, Mike, last last meeting, I had a conversation with uh, Tessa Chernovsky. I think that, I'm, and I may be butchering her last name there someplace. Uh, regarding funding and I didn't get we we went through the funding and where it was and it's 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 a sort of a random walk through the universe once you get involved in that stuff uh but one of the things she mentioned that she's working with you to to put a homeless shelter in the courthouse in the civic center I didn't I wasn't aware that you're not that's not okay that, that was she, what she told me and I just want to make absolutely sure absolutely not I'm not in favor of that, and we have not had that talk the way you're saying it. They've mentioned it, but I don't, I don't favor just, that idea okay. at all. I didn't, I didn't have a chance to go back and ask her again, but if you're saying it is, then I'll let that issue drop. Uh, and then I'd just like to thank everybody who made the trip to the Addison House over the Christmas holidays. Uh, they got a bunch of people there. I think everybody went, had a good time. Uh, keep going. I mean, look, this is a a landmark here in Malibu, and I think it's something everybody should get a chance to take a look at. So for everybody you went, I thank you very, very much. And Ruth, Ruthie, I'm glad to have you on board. Thank you very much. All right, Paul, back to you. Thank you, Steve. Karen, I see your hand. Yeah, okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, Lisa, I too wanna say thank you so much. Um, your professionalism, your dedication, your knowledge has been invaluable to the city. It's our loss that this is your last week and Culver City's gain, but I wish you the best of luck there and know that you'll be missed. And Ruthie, welcome to this new position. I know you're not a stranger to the city, so um, I look forward to working with you in this new position. I wanna thank Rob DeBow and his crew and everybody at the city for the huge response to the storm on December 30th. There were issues all over the city. I was on the phone with Rob because of people who were calling me and they were able to respond uh, in an extraordinary situation. So I heard somewhere that it was the biggest storm in 22 years. I can't remember uh, a bigger one. I don't know if that's exactly true, but I just, I wanna acknowledge the staff uh, and I'm sure that that day was going to be remembered for a long time. Um, there was a comment made tonight um, about um, something about sexual harassment in the uh, uh, report uh, regarding Reva Feldman. I don't remember that ever being part of it. Uh, so I don't. I'm not sure how that information came to be, but uh, I don't ever remember sexual harassment being part of that claim. Um, 
Don, we've talked about the sprinkler system before. I uh, am happy to continue those talks. I'm obviously, and I think everybody in the council is in favor of applying for any government money that we can get, whether it's from the county, the state, or the federal government. So we're obviously on board with that. Um, Olivia Jolly, you and I haven't met, but I did uh, communicate back and forth several times with Kelly Walton about the uh, gas powered leaf blowers and exactly what's already been said. They're already illegal in the city. And uh, as I explained to Kelly Walton, we encourage you to contact code enforcement so that that can be addressed. And I think it is, as Mikey said, a lot of times the property owner doesn't even realize what's happening uh, on their property. Anne Payne, you and I also spoke, I think it was day before yesterday, about um, the Im incredible amount of debris that came down Malibu Creek. And I don't recommend that private citizens put their lives at risk dealing with that. I know that John did, and, and I want to acknowledge him for, for doing that, uh, along with the rest of the crew that helped him. But yeah, we've got to deal with the creek. Um, we're at the receiving end of, of a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and yeah, I, I'm sure Paul will be talking to Cal Strat about that. There's no doubt in my mind. Um, and I will be talking to Terry Dipple, who's the executive director of the COG, about how to um, address that with the other COG cities. Um, regarding the housing element, I'm sure, uh, Jamie, you know that it's on our agenda tonight. Um, it's an eight-year cycle, is my understanding, and hopefully we will pass it tonight. Um, and affordable housing is something uh, that uh, Mikey Pierce and I, in particular, have been working on since we got elected. It's complicated. Uh, obviously, our property values are very high here. Uh, we've been working with um, Community Corps of Santa Monica, who I have a lot of uh, faith in. I don't believe they've done a project outside of Santa Monica. Maybe Malibu will be the first one uh, if, uh, if the pieces come together, but we're still working on it and we have uh, another meeting on it this week. Um, yeah, and we're, uh, as, a, as a council, we are working toward uh, finding a city manager. Um, Ryan, you addressed the recruiter. I don't know if he was drunk. I hope not on that call. Um, he was chosen by the ad hoc committee uh, out of the uh, recruiting firms that threw their hat in the ring for this job. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to conclude that sometime soon. Um, and Steve, thank you for bringing up the uh, substation, the sheriff substation at the college. Um, Okay, if we need to set up another ad hoc for that, then we shall do that. Uh, and hopefully we'll have the funding to pay for it. Uh, I believe the number I was told in the past was uh, in the area of $3 million a year. Uh, so we'll see if we can make that happen. And those are my comments, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Bruce? Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, first of all, I want to applaud Steve McClary for the excellent job he's been doing as interim city manager. He was thrown into a mess, and he's done a great job of keeping the city working while we fumble through the process of locating and hiring a permanent city manager. So Steve has my respect. I believe he has the respect of the other council members. Um, I sense Steve has the respect of the staff, and uh, Steve even appears to have the respect of many members of the public who are hard sell, and that's not an easy achievement. So thanks for the job you've been doing, Steve. Um, the elephant in the room, there have been so many speakers tonight talking about this report, and, and I did not encourage anyone to do that, I want to make that clear, but um, I knew it was coming, and I'm glad it did. Look, on, on March 8th of last year, the following item appeared on the council's agenda. At the request of Mayor Pearson and Council Member Farrer, Farrer, I'm sorry, consider whether to hire an outside firm to investigate the allegations of harassment contained in the January 16, 2021 letter from Riva Feldman's attorneys. I was recused from the decision on that item. I publicly proclaimed, however, that I didn't any, do anything unlawful or violative of any city policy. 
And I was confident that an investigation by an independent employment lawyer would confirm that to be the case. The city council voted to commission an investigation by an independent employment lawyer of the now former city manager's claims that I engaged in, and this was what the allegation was, Karen, gender-based discrimination in the form of harassment and or creating a hostile work environment in violation of applicable state and federal law and or Malibu city policy. If someone didn't understand that, they weren't doing their homework. The vote was three to one with Steve Uring opposed. At the city council meeting of December 13, multiple residents called for my resignation, recall and or censure, raising again allegedly unlawful conduct vis-a-vis the now former city manager. This led to multiple residents questioning whatever became of the independent legal investigation commissioned by the city council. When asked by residents, I have consistently declined to so much as confirm or deny that the investigation was completed. It's been my answer. I can't say anything about it. I can't tell you anything about it. A couple of weeks ago, however, the interim city attorney, John Cotty, did confirm to a resident that the independent investigation was completed in July, five months ago, and that the city council members had received a written report from the lawyer engaged to perform the investigation. Again, five months ago. So, you know, when you're here tonight, of course we should release it. Five months ago. So it's now public knowledge that the independent investigation of the legality of my action was concluded and the city council members received a report of the investigation in July. When the report was first provided to me in July, I asked that the result of the investigation be publicly disclosed. I was told that doing so would violate the terms of the separation agreement with the now former city manager. And I was told the report is privileged and could be disclosed only by a vote of the city council as recently occurred with the report of the investigation of Jefferson Wagner's allegations. Accordingly, I didn't press the issue. Since that time, I've been told, I have told everyone who's asked me again, I can't confirm or deny anything about the investigation, nor have I encouraged anyone to seek public disclosure of the report, which until a couple of weeks ago, nobody even knew to exist. Other, of course, than the city council members and anyone that they may have been less careful to tell than I had been. I don't know if that occurred or not. Tonight, multiple residents have called for the city council to vote to release the report. Because I was recused from the vote to conduct the investigation of the legality of my conduct, I'm gonna recuse myself when that vote occurs as well. If the report is released, however, I'm hopeful it will be without redaction and that the city council also will waive privilege respecting legal advice, if any, obtained by the, from the city's lawyers prior to the time the city council voted to commission the independent investigation of the legality of my conduct. I think that'll be important. When the city council voted to commission the investigation of the legality of my actions, Steve Uring asked what was the purpose of the investigation. One council member replied that it might provide a basis to recall me if it were determined my actions were unlawful. Additionally, it's notable that just two weeks later, Karen and Paul unveiled a sweeping proposal to amend city council policies, which included the following. It shall be a violation of these protocols for any sitting member of the city council or any commission to violate any general law or regulation or any rule, law, ordinance, or resolution of the city of Malibu. It shall also be a violation of these protocols for any sitting member of the city council or any commission to violate an administrative policy of the city, which has been adopted following a vote of the city council or any commission on the matter and which by its terms is expressly made applicable to such body. And then they provided that anyone who did those things could be subject to censure, public censure by the city council. Does anyone really believe that the hope and purpose of the city council commissioning an independent investigation of legality of my conduct was anything other than to provide a basis to censure me and seek to have me recalled? And as John Mazza commented on social media just yesterday, when asked how he knew of the result of the independent investigation, quote, if it had said Bruce was guilty, the three would have released it, close quote. I had nothing to do with John posting that, and I consistently encouraged people to not speculate about the result of the independent investigation, which again, I had not even confirmed to have concluded when I'd been asked. Now, City Council Resolution 9883, adopted November 9, 1998, includes the following statement. Members of the city council shall maintain a polite, respectful, and courteous manner when addressing one another. Additionally, the sweeping city council policies proposed by Karen and Paul included all of the following. The mayor controls the meeting and discourages personal attacks of any kind from speakers by encouraging them instead to productively address issues at hand. 
The mayor, council members, and all commission and committee members treat everyone with courtesy and respect. And then council members shall accord the utmost courtesy to each other, to city employees, and to the public appearing before the council, and shall refrain at all times from rude and derogatory remarks, reflections as to integrity, abusive comments and statements as to motives and personalities, which disrupt, disturb, or otherwise impede the orderly conduct of the meeting. These are Paul and Karen's proposals. Now, last week, a chorus of the friends of Karen and Paul, some of whom they've appointed to city commissions, publicly called for my resignation, recall or censure, again, raising my allegedly unlawful treatment of the now former city manager. Rather than rebuff the claims of her friends or simply remain silent on that subject, Karen publicly accused me of defrauding the Malibu public and suggesting that I be recalled. Karen also called me a narcissist based on an armchair psychology degree she appears to have earned by reading articles on the internet. Additionally, Paul Grisanti falsely accused me of scrubbing my social media to delete comments that I had defied anyone to identify in my public posts. I did not do any such thing. I defy Karen and Paul to explain how their conduct and that of their associates comported with their own proposal that, quote, council members shall accord the utmost courtesy to each other, close quote, and quote, at all time, refrain at all times from rude and derogatory remarks, reflections as to integrity, abusive comments, and statements as, to, statements as to motives and personalities. Karen also publicly accused me of being the reason for multiple staff departures, including the city attorney, the city clerk, and most recently the city the assistant city manager and others. Let's examine the reasons for those staff departures that Karen seeks to lay at my doorstep. Christy Hogan, she announced her retirement before I was seated on city council. She claimed her doing so had no relationship to the election. I actually hope that I was the cause, but she says otherwise. Heather Glazer, she applied for the position before the election occurred, and she moved to a, she, she moved to a position near her hometown in Northern California. Lisa Soger, she's worked here for more than a year following the election. She was offered a position as a CFO at a larger city, a raise in a position closer to her home. And, and as noted, today's, tonight is Lisa's last night with our city council. I, I, I wish you the best of luck in your new position, Lisa. Recent planning technician left. I'm sure I'll be blamed for that. He got a two level promotion, a higher pay and a lesser commute at Calabasas. According to Richard Malika, the planning director, the common theme for their departure has been stress, commute, workload, lack of tools to accomplish tasks and pay. I've learned that when it comes to pay, we cannot compete with our surrounding cities. Well, that's an issue that predated my election to the city council and which has festered for many years prior. Also many other problems that have existed for multiple years are now beginning to bubble to the surface now that the prior administration is not here to keep them out of sight. Now, for years, the city has been myopically focused on finances and maintaining a triple A bond rating while needed infrastructure has been overlooked and deliberately abjured. While a balanced budget is important, there are times when capital improvements are more important so that the future budgets can be balanced. Otherwise, there comes a day of reckoning when all of the funds saved from deferring necessary maintenance and improvements become so expensive, they wipe out the entirety of the savings. Relatedly, when Karen was the mayor, the prior city council advised by the now former city attorney and led by the now former city manager agreed to a low ball settlement of the city's Woolsey fire claims against SCE that was on the order of one half to two thirds of what it should have been. They also agreed to release claims against other parties who didn't contribute to the settlement and who were represented by the same lawyers who represented the city. I publicly opposed that settlement when it was announced as a resident and I opposed the engagement of the conflicted law firm. Nonetheless, Karen and her associates accused me, have accused me of costing the city hundreds of thousands of dollars because I had the audacity to press for a formal investigation of allegations of corruption and criminality advanced by Jefferson Wagner, which actually cost just over $100,000. Aside from the fact that these claims are deceptively inaccurate, they're also the height of hypocrisy when one considers the millions of dollars the former city council left on the table with FC SCE at a time when Karen was the mayor of Malibu. And I might add, having had no meaningful experience in that role when she was appointed to the position for no reason other than she had obtained the highest number of votes in the most recent election. I remember, and I remember the night that she was appointed mayor pro temp. The, the, the discussion was, well, Karen got the most votes. I guess that makes her the mayor pro temp. I'll say yes. Chris, anyway, we're getting a little, council member Silverstein, we're getting a little off topic. I'm moving to the, the next topic. 
I thank you, John. I've got one more paragraph and then I'm moving to the next topic. If the city council had listened to me when I objected to the proposed settlement of the Woolsey fire claims, the city would be far better off today. And the amount spent to investigate Jefferson Wagner's claims and to settle with the now former city manor, manager would be insubstantial in comparison to the gains the city could have realized. Now, other business. I've had a lot of discussions over the past few weeks with people who are struggling to get their houses rebuilt after the Woolsey fire. Our top priority for city council for the past three years before my election has been Woolsey fire rebounds, re rebuilds. I would like to agendize for a vote a policy that Woolsey fire rebuild should be the first thing heard at all planning commission meetings. Nothing else should be heard until all rebuilds in the docket for the meeting are resolved. And, and by rebuilds, I mean primary residences of people who lost their home, not people who bought the property afterwards. I also believe that we should be voting to, on, a, on a policy in which Woolsey fire rebuilds are given priority status of inspectors and other staff always move to the head of the line when ready for approvals and inspections. I don't know why that wasn't done three years ago. I've also had a lot of discussions with a lot of residents about code enforcement issues in the past month. Dumpster locking ordinance, gas blowers, as was mentioned tonight, dark skies as to service stations, and development in general. Um, with respect to everything but development, we have volunteers on patrol for traffic and parking type issues. I don't know why we can't have them to make sure that a dumpster is locked, that a gas blower is not being used, and that a light is not shining where it shouldn't be. They, don't, they, they can report that to the city and the city can then issue appropriate fines. It's time to begin enforcing our laws. It's also time to begin as, as one resident tonight, I think it was um, Rosemary Sampson said, taking our vision statement and mission statement seriously. They're municipal ordinances, they're part of our zoning code, they're therefore part of our local coastal plan, and they're pur pursuant to the California Coastal Act. It says that explicitly. So alternatively, let's have a referendum to appeal them, referendum to appeal them. I mean, if we're not gonna take it seriously, why do we have it as a law? One way or the other, the, the, the residents as of right now want these things, we're not giving them to them. Now, specific responses to comments by the residents. Don Schmitz, Sounds like a great idea on the surface, and I certainly want to explore it. I just want to make sure, and because I'm not, I've heard this from many people, that this isn't a Chinatown type issue, the movie Chinatown with Jack Nicholson, where the water is being um, diverted for the purpose of improving the value of land. There are a lot of rumors that have been circulating around the city for a long time about properties that have been purchased at low prices and which will increase dramatically in value if water can be taken up to the hills. And using um, fire prevention as the basis to get that there, if that's what's going on, would be inexcusable. If that's not the basis for what's going on, it's applaudable, so, oh, assuming it's actually it actually works. And, and I'm interested in learning much more about that. Uh, Karen's statement that she's up for getting federal money or grant money for anything we can. I mean, you know, we can get, get grant money probably to build a casino here. I mean, you don't get grant money just because it's available. You get it for laudable purposes. Um, Jamie Wendell, you know, I, I'm sorry, I, I found those comments about our residents insulting. We're not, we're not a town of only a bunch of millionaires, and I'm sure that a lot of people who are struggling to rebuild their homes that were burned in the fire would take substantial issue with that comment. My, what I heard was a petulant child who just wants what he wants but can't have it. Oh, well, the law is what it is. We're going to have a housing element put up for approval tonight. We'll see where it goes. But, you know, there's a lot of things I want to that I can't have. The speculation by Ryan about the recruiter, totally inappropriate, Ryan. I mean, you know, unless you, unless you know something like that, that, that's not an appropriate thing to speculate. And Karen, I, I don't know if it's true, but I hope not. I mean, we can do better than that. Uh, let's not speculate. And, and, and let's not speculate about what's been going on behind closed doors, because it's not anything that you just heard from Ryan tonight. Lastly, the ad hoc committee for the sheriff station. I think that's a great idea. Um, I'm hopeful that since I've been excluded from so many other committees, I can be put on that. I've got a great relationship with um, Captain Becerra and Lieutenant Braden, as well as others within the sheriff's department. So I'm hopeful that if, if that's an appropriate thing to do, I'll be considered for that. And uh, sorry for the overly long response, but I, I, a lot was said about me last meeting and I held my comments and thought about them and I um, needed to get those things off my chest. So thank you for the time.
Okay. Thank you, Bruce. I'm gonna I'll bring the protocols back since you 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 like them now. Uh, I just want to take a moment to thank uh, I want to thank Lisa for all you put up with and everything you've done for the city, both before I got here and and after. And we're gonna miss you. And I I can tell you that I've been so. When I first got involved with the city, I became concerned. I was hearing things about our budgets was, were bad and everything. I have a client who ran casinos. The man can can devour budgets, budgeting. I mean, he loves that. I gave it to him. He played with it for two days. He said, this is great. This is fabulous. This is exactly what you want. Everything was wonderful, always wonderful, always proper. And I can't thank you enough for getting us those awards. What is it, seven years in a row now? More? And uh, the, really... for the financial report, it's I think we're on 18. Well, yeah, we're in good shape. So I, I appreciate that. And Ruthie, I want to welcome you. I look forward to actually getting to see you face to face in 3D. Uh, I've only seen you on on the computer and I would love for that to change and I look forward to working with you. Uh, I wanna thank Rob and his crew for what they did during the rains. Uh, that was as bad as, as we had it here. Uh, they managed to get things so that when people were out the next day, it was, it was not nearly as bad as it could have been uh, I, I, I went and visited the storm damage at the lagoon. I saw the lagoon breach, which fortunately is in the right place. And it's a deep breach and, and who knows, the Adamson house is safe because of that. I hope it doesn't get moved back over to in front of the Adamson house. Uh, the Malibu West flood basin, Mikey and I have talked about it. And I went and looked at it with my, with my grandchildren it's a most amazing uh, testament to the force of what was going on that that I have seen in quite a while. The fact that the uh, the huge concrete beam along the bottom of it was broken in half and opened up that barrier like a set of barn doors was amazing. And I'm grateful that everything was all cleaned out before that that uh, rain, so that there was no further damage to the community. Uh, I did uh, talk to Ann Payne and go by and see what was going on there. And I think that part of the problem that Sarah Retreat is having is over the years, there have been so many additional, there's so much material that's been deposited that backs it up. Uh, and I think it's, we got to figure out a way to deal with uh, fish and wildlife about possibly opening out, taking some of the sand out, out of there and moving it to the ocean where it's trying to get to. And uh, as far as meeting attendance, I've attended meetings on the Zoom and uh, most recently with, uh, most recently relative to fire damage and stuff like that. So there's there's lots of different things that will, will occupy every second that someone will issue to them. So I'm gonna thank everyone for coming tonight. And as far as the people who came and spoke, thank you for speaking. Thank you for those of you who reminded me of my father. And I will uh, move right on to item number three, one, the consent calendar. Only instead of, uh, we actually have an item 3A1. And I don't know that that is, is that separate or is it part of the consent? That is part of the consent calendar, but item 3A1 has been pulled by the public along with 3B2 and 3B11. Hold on just a second. Let me make a note. 3A1 is pulled. 3B2. Correct. And and three. Three B eleven. Three B eleven. Bruce, do you have something you wish to add to that list? 
Yes, please pull 3B7 and 3B12. 3B12 and 3B7. Okay, does anyone else have anything they'd like to pull from the consent calendar? I see no hands. Can I have a motion to approve the consent calendar with the exception of items 3A1, 3B2, 3B7, 3B11, and 3B12? I'll make that motion. I'll second, I'll second it. Any comments? Kelsey, will you take the roll, please? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Yurin? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, we'll begin hearing the items pulled from the consent calendar. Item 3A1 is a, uh, we're conducting a second reading unless waived and adopt ordinance number 496. Uh, can we hear from whoever pulled it? Yes, there were two speakers for this item. They are Bill Sampson and John Mazza. We'll hear from Bill Sampson first. Thank you, Bill. Are you available? Hey, I'm here. The problem here is, you know, we've got ordinances. As a matter of fact, the dark sky ordinance should have been enforceable last October, and we're still messing around with this. Why didn't somebody start writing citations? I think it was October 21st. We've had years on this, and now you guys want to give more time? You've got to be kidding us. Every couple of days, yeah, I'll rephrase that, every couple of weeks, somebody else comes here and puts up a bunch of lights. I don't know what they're afraid of or what they're doing, or they don't even live here. The end of my street now there's a house that must have i don't know a hundred thousand candle power going all the time absolute insanity and instead of doing something about it under existing law right now that's illegal yet in front of you is an ordinance to give them another year they don't need another year turn off the lights put the hoods on them rosemary got hoods on the lights at the high school at the uh, elementary school at Cabrillo parking lot it says about 20 years ago when Margaret was in the before and after school program it was an unlit lot where six and seven year olds were being picked up and it was completely dark well she got the lights in and they're safe and they're hooded that was done over 20 years ago our kid just turned 36 that's how long she's been gone from that institution and now you guys are talking seriously, give them some more time. To heck with it, drop it. It's currently what's going on is illegal today. Send code enforcement out, write some tickets. Forget this, yeah, your job isn't just to keep granting exceptions to what we have voted to have you do. You are failing miserably. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Our next speaker is John Mazza. Hi, John. Are you available? I certainly am. Uh, I was working on the Dark Sky Ordinance years ago with Steve Yearing and Cami Winnikoff. And this was a citizen-driven initiative. Like all important things in Malibu, they always start with the citizens. And they spend five to six years raising the money Getting the experts, the same thing's true of the anti-rodenticide and, and the dumpsters and a lot of other things. So I, I, I know you're going to pass this. I know you're going to move it till October. But I want you to consider the fact that you should be initiating what is good for Malibu. Not forcing people to do it. And then you should enforce it. This should have been enforced a long time ago. I know I always mention Laguna, and that's because they've had a house there for 48 years. And I know their government. They wrote right in their uh, Dark Skies Ordinance the enforcement. We have no enforcement. We have a thing called Council Policy 43 that says city can't enforce anything unless somebody turns them in. Well, that does a lot of good at night when you have no enforcement officers. 
And so now this is being put off until three weeks before the election, which means you've punted a whole term. And there's no reason you can't put a hood around a, a gas station. Laguna Beach wrote right in their ordinance how to enforce it and gave people six months, six months. And it was no problem. The whole town went dark. And everybody cooperated because they're used to following rules. The same thing happens with leaf blowers, dumpsters, uh, all kinds of things because we have no enforcement. Doug Clevenger does a good job, and he's got two, two, three people, and they don't work at night. So if we don't establish something that has enforcement at night, you might as well forget the dark skies ordinance. It sunshines during the day. Okay? Sunshines during the day, guys. So it it is not your job after you've passed a law to decide, oh, I don't feel like enforcing it. It's not the city manager's job. It's nobody's job. Either don't pass it or enforce it. It's been 11 years since Nobu violated their CUP. We have done nothing, zero, to fix it. It's still in effect as a violation because somebody doesn't want to mess with Nobu. But meanwhile, 9,000-plus 9, 9, U.S. I mean, Malibu residents have to drive through that mess every evening, every afternoon. So think about that. I know you're going to pass this, but think about the fact that you need to be more proactive and you need to actually enforce something sometime. Thank you. Thank you, John. Any other comments? I don't have any Kelsey? other signups and I don't have any raised hands from the public. So that concludes public comment. Bruce, you're on. Thanks. So. Um, when we sent this to Planning Commission to come back to us to approve what we sent to the Planning Commission to recommend, which is a weird policy, um, we said it should include uh, better enforcement, better, more, better, more strict um, consequences for violation if we're going to give more time. It's not here. So I, I can't support it for that reason. Um, so relatedly, um, over the past few weeks, I've been having communications with the um, consultant that the city hired to help enforce this law and specifically with respect to the service station, which are already in violation and we're not extending their deadline. And, um, you know, the consultant was hired to help us bring the service stations into compliance. And I understand the consultant's going to be recommending that the way to bring them into compliance is to weaken the law so that they're in compliance, which to me is insane. Um, I understand that there are ways to make the service stations be in compliance. It could be done with a snap of the finger because there are plenty of ways that they can keep the light underneath their um, ceilings, whatever those the porticos that, that, that people get their gas under. Um, they're not doing it. They have all kinds of excuses for why they won't do it. And now we've got a consultant that we've hired that's going to help them not have to do it. You know, it, it just falls in line with what Bill and John were both saying. And it's, what I said earlier, we have, what's the good of having laws if we're not going to enforce them? Let's start enforcing our laws. And this one, you know, where are the fines? Where are the increased fines? Where's the um, stick that goes with the carrot? Because there isn't any that I can see. Thank you, Bruce. Steve, and then followed by Mikey. Uh, yes, I, I don't disagree with anything Bruce just said. I mean, when this ordinance got, came before us the last time, I asked, what was the plan to implement this? Uh, and we don't have one. Uh, now, we're going to have to get one. If it, it, otherwise, nothing's going to happen. And it's interesting because I'm getting calls from a lot of residents. I've got residents who are willing to step up and help us do some of this stuff. Uh, you know, they're asking me what they can do to help the city enforce and implement this dark sky ordinance. And unless the city's got a plan to sort of take the lead on that, a lot of these people are just going to be, you know, whistling in the wind. So I'm hoping that, you know, maybe after our administrative and finance committee meeting on Wednesday, we can see what we got left for, for some money and hopefully get some imp implementation program going so we can get this working the way it's supposed to work. And I agree with Bruce. I, you know, I, I'm not, I don't, I, I don't think I want to let Jim Ben, you know, 
change the rules. <laughs> we we spent a lot of time getting those rules and LZ1 um, model put together. And I tend to agree with you. I don't think I want to see them get dropped. So that's all I got, Paul. Thank you, Steve. Mikey? Yeah, then I, I see Richard is here. Um, okay. So to the speakers, and maybe to Mayor Pro Tem, honor, you know, respectfully, there's comments about taking care of people who burn down and then acting like we're doing nothing. So we, we're trying to pull all resources to get people back in their homes. That's, that's the issue on top of the pandemic, landing on top of it. Nobody wants to delay the dark sky ordinance. I'm unaware that Jim Benny wants to weaken it. Uh, that's, that's news to me. He's the expert that everyone involved in this wanted hired. So that is concerning to me. Um, he is supposedly the preeminent expert in the United States on this. Um, I was there at the beginning. I was one of the planning commissioners that helped push this through. I'm as excited to see it as anything. I think probably the most intelligent thing I heard said was from Steve. If at A&F here in a couple of days, we can find the extra money to push this forward because it's going to take resources. That's what we know because our resources are busy somewhere else. Um, that That is a good plan. That plan makes sense to me. I think we're all excited to see this push through. But if it comes down to, you know, what's our priority? If we have to delay dark sky to get people back in their homes, if that is really the choice, that was an, that's an easy one for me. Is as, as excited as I am to see it happen. I live in a dark sky neighborhood. We have no street lights. We have rules here. It's wonderful. We see the stars. I agree. I can't wait for the rest of Malibu to follow suit. So with that, Mayor, I'd point out that Richard is, is here and... Um, It'd probably be good to hear what he has to say at some point. Thank you. Richard, do you want to jump into this or Yolanda? What I can say, and, and I've we've been working with Yolanda uh, and the folks in ESD on this, is that we are going to be putting together an item. Uh, we're looking at February 14th uh, to one, bring the the comments from our lighting engineer as to what the issues are with the gas stations and his proposal and why he believes it to be necessary. And then also uh, to start up uh, discussions about the code enforcement aspect of this. And then also, like I mentioned, working with Yolanda's group, they'll be handling the outreach and we are working with them on that too. We today worked on a postcard that's going to go out to all residents to alert them to upcoming deadlines and the fact that they will be subject to code enforcement. So we are working towards getting together what needs to be done, which is uh, time for uh, study groups or, or, or public outreach sessions, which um, as one of the council members pointed out, the focus became uh, fire rebuilds is my understanding. And that is why uh, two years ago that outreach didn't take place. Uh, the uh, last aspect of this that I want to make certain is clear to all is that new lighting uh, that's installed has to be dark skies compliant. They're, that's not uh, up for discussion. Uh, these deadlines affect folks that have existing lighting that needs to be brought into compliance. So it sounded like from some of the speakers that there are new lights, or if I understood correctly, that were installed. And if that is the case, uh, then reporting that to us would be the way to go. I did receive reports from another member of the public already about some commercial lighting, and we were looking into that because that apparently was lighting that was recently installed uh, that we did not review. So we are looking at that one. And if, like as I mentioned, please let us know if there is new lighting going on, because that is something that uh, right now, regardless of dates, that needs to be brought into compliance is something that we're looking at. Yes, just to add to that, Richard, um, before you, item 3A is the second reading on, on the adoption of this ordinance, uh, making all the residential, commercial, institutional be in compliance by October of this year. As Richard mentioned before, you, you're not only talking about new uh, development, you're talking about existing. There is more than 5,600 homes that needs to be on compliance as of residential. 
And, and I think one thing that uh, for the implementation is not that we haven't thought about it, it's something new that just came through council because uh, we were putting all of our efforts on the fire rebels. Now we need to concentrate on this task. And the task is to make all of the homes and all the commercial business into compliance by October. This is not an easy task. And um, there's the regu this regulation that stipulates different uh, items on the ordinance, such as security lighting, it needs to have the automatic controls. There cannot be any splashing of lights. Um, and there's a specific height on the exterior fixtures. We're going to be looking at the existing landscape lighting. So it, it's not a self-certified uh, program. This, um, the vast majority of homeowners will need to come in and we might need to go through permits. And that's what we're um, strategizing on how best roll this program out. But this Burley was, and I know has been as a the decision of the city that has happened in the past five years, but it was put on hold. And now that it's moving forward, we're thinking on the implementation and the best way to be successful at it. Uh, the implementation of the city, uh, we need to, I, I know the majority of the homeowners and and a few homeowners are aware of what they, uh, the ordinance talk about, but the rest of the community does not. So the first step is the outreach. As Richard mentioned, we will be sending, if the ordinance passes tonight, uh, a postcard that will go to those 5,600 homes plus all the commercial institution on the city. The postcard is ready to go as soon as you say it is a pass and then it comes in October 22nd. Um, 2022, the, uh, the approval, the postcards will go out on Wednesday and it's ready to go. But um, this is a big undertaking. And yes, we do need the resources. And yes, we need also prioritizing our operations um, with the fire, with the new organic um, recycling and all the other items that we have. We're trying as best of how to implement this program and be successful and follow what council wants us to do and the community wants us to do. By doing this, we are preparing to do workshops, uh, social media, putting ads, and we want to discuss more on the, the more into depth and on our administrative and finance uh, meeting. Um, so, so we can think and bring to you and there's an item on the administrative and finance items on what we think is going to be needed for this um, mid-year as far as the finances portion of it. Uh, but we are aware of what needs to be done. And um, we just need direction and prioritizing what, what is as you as council and as community want us to focus. Is it still the fire rebels on this 5,600 possibly permits that are going to come to or through us? And um, so uh, it's a lot of information and having the, the expert, the lighting expert um, be part of the team, we can be uh, more effective in a better way that we can answer to most of the, what we anticipate that community members and homeowners are gonna be seeking um, as far as responses on how to be in compliance with this uh, ordinance. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you. Steve? Yeah, I and and I don't argue. We've got a lot of stuff on our plate that we got to try and get done. And I'm going to suggest that if we're going to do this ordinance, we just got to get smart about the way we do it. Uh, you know, enforcement. We don't have any enforcement. And what Laguna did is come up with a program that says they took this city council policy 43 that we had and threw it out the door. And said, if, you, if you've got your neighbor that's got the light shining up, you can call up somebody and they'll come out and say something to that person without ex exposing your name. That to me is, a, is, a, is an effective way to make people aware of the fact that this, you know, there's a lighting ordinance in place and we got to take care of it. I talked to the folks over at the uh, Annawalt Lumber. The guy, and I can't remember his name, not, not the gentleman who owned it, but his son, 
uh, came from a community where they did the dark sky lighting. He was willing to set up a program inside the store that had all the lights, it had all the, the, the covers, all the rest of that stuff. So if people had a question, they had some place they could go to get some information about how to put this together. I'm just saying there's some things we can probably do inside the, and like I said, they're members of the community that are willing to help us. So uh, I, it's not gonna be easy. Uh, you're exactly right, it's gonna take some effort. Uh, but if, I think we just got to get a little smarter about how we're going to do it. And if we do that, I think we got a chance, uh, a good shot of getting this thing done and done correctly within the time frame. So that's all I got. I think Thank just, you, Steve. Just to add to that, uh, Steve and uh, Mayor, I'm sorry to interrupt, is the splashing of light. And that's something that I want to make sure that community understand. And uh, so I'm bringing, that's how we're implementing this. The splashing of light is one of the items within this ordinance that is not just as easy well is that it's splashing into my neighbors. For that, uh, for implementation, uh, the photometric study by a lighting consultant, that is what is gonna be required, especially on, on, on parcels that are so tied together. Uh, I'm not so concerned about the parcels that have a, a bigger acreage and they're not so close to other residents. It's, it, the problem or the challenge that I see is gonna come in when we have parcels that are very tight and we have exterior lighting, gate um, security lighting, and it's, there's a splashing of light into the adjacent uh, uh, properties and the photometric study by a lighting consultant, that is possibly what is gonna be required for us to review and make sure that it's on compliance. So uh, a, a lot to think about and a lot to information that we need to relate to the public. Thank you, Yolanda. Bruce? Paul, you have your hand up, and I spoke already. Do you want to go first, and then I'll add my comments? Uh, I, I think that your your previous comments about pass, telling sending out people tomorrow to start issuing tickets is is not good public relations. And I think we ought to move this forward and use the nine months we have between now and the date this is uh, becomes effective to educate the public and get them motivated towards moving this forward. And I'd like to make a motion that we pass this on the second reading and start with the next phase, which is figuring out enforcement and doing all the, the other things we're gonna have to do to make this a success in October. So I don't know if I have a second for that. I'll second that, Paul. So I got a motion and a second. Discussion, Bruce? Yeah, just quickly, I mean, Woolsey fire rebuilds are a priority. As I said before, I'd like to see us come back with an item to make them a legislative priority, not just a policy I, priority. I don't think that that's oh, agendized oh, at the moment, me, Bruce. Excuse me, Paul, it's just a comment. I'm entitled to say what I what I believe, okay? Um, if it's If Yolanda and Richard and people who are approving Woolsey fire rebuilds and helping Woolsey fire rebuilds get built are being distracted by this. We have a misallocation of resources. I mean, Richard and Yolanda shouldn't have to touch dark skies with a 10 foot pole. And Woolsey fire rebuilds aren't going away by October. We're gonna have as large a inventory as we have right now, if not larger, come this October. So. I mean, are we just going to kick the ball, kick the can down the lane a little more come October? We have a law. I don't, I don't understand why we aren't working to simplify the permitting process as opposed to find extending this and finding ways to satisfy a complicated system. So, I mean, I understand we are where we are. I don't think we need to extend the law just because we are where we are. People should have to comply with it. But in any event, as I said before, I don't understand why we don't have a stricter um, fine scheme, which we said, I mean, that was the vote we did. We, the vote we had um, two months ago, three months ago, whenever it was, was to grant this extension subject to having a greater fine schedule and stricter enforcement. And we only have half of the proposal here. And again, it shouldn't be up to Richard or Yolanda or their planning staff to be able to put that in writing and propose it. That's, you know, there are other people that can do that. The city's attorneys can do that. There are administrative people that can make those proposals. We don't need to be taking resources away from the Woolsey Fire rebuild. So it's not inconsistent to want to do both. Thank you, Bruce. 
We have a motion and a second. Kelsey, will you take the roll? Mayor Brisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Yuri? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? No. Motion carried. Okay, item 3B2, the warrant register. I understand a member of the public has pulled this. So yes, can, we can have I... one speaker for this item. It is Ryan. Okay. Ryan, are you available? Yes, I am. Thank you. And do you have um, a copy of the warrant register in front of you? Could you start my clock over, please? I don't need to be um, ushered by the uh, parliamentarian at this meeting. I'm sorry, Paul. I, I really have to take offense to your interrupting. I've seen you do it a couple times tonight already, and it's just not customary or appropriate. So I'm so I, sorry, Ryan. I was simply asking if you have a copy of, I did not expect them to have started your time, but I'm asking if you have a copy of the warrant register so that when you tell us something is wrong, you can tell us it's on page two, line whatever it is, or page eight, line whatever it is. If so. you'd like, if you'd, um, thank you for setting prerequisites on my public testimony, Mayor Grisanti, but I'm sorry, it's inappropriate. I'll state that a second time. I do have a warrant register open. Yes, I've downloaded it and I can get very specific and I think I'll use all of my time very specifically, although I didn't think I needed to. Um, as far as the uh, budgeting, this is $3.6 million, which is probably of record with this city. And what I noticed was, and I'm saying this for the public, and um, you can look it up yourself. The $739,000, which was the bill for sheriff services for October, which I have no problem with, appears to have not been paid. And then you go ahead and pay them the same monthly retainer amount for November, which has not been paid. Um, which is probably appropriate bill lag. However, what was with this free loan from October? Why didn't we pay them in October? Why wasn't it on the last warrant register, which was also a record? And I believe you appear approved that warrant register in a special meeting at an odd time of the day or a, in not a regular meeting schedule as listed in the municipal code for when you're supposed to have your meetings. So, you know, it, it wasn't there when everybody was having a regular meeting to talk about. It was, I think, at a special meeting. But you're spending a boatload of money. And some of the comments about the staff, you know, not feeling in the mood to enforce laws and bringing these extensions back to you and so forth. You got the tail wagging the dog issue. I, I don't talk about the $5,500 for the uh, recruiter, the guy who I also got a slam from the a public. Uh, comment. Um, I have a right to make my public comment and opinion, and I stated what other people had told me, and I heard slurred speech, I heard disorientation, and I heard Bruce yourself, you said, you know, he, he seemed quite different than he appeared in Zoom meetings prior to. That's part of the record of the meeting of December 13th. So um, I, I made that comment with very much trepidation, except it was pretty self- evident. Um, however, um, why is the, the city not paying the sheriff's contract on time? Or did they forget to bill us? I, I kind of doubt that. Um, we're also paying $972 for traffic signal, uh, repair and maintenance, uh, ramble a light for electricity, and so forth. Um, some of which should be covered by a memorandum of understanding yet appears that we're also paying the electrical bills directly and not as a reimbursement to uh, the county or the state or any other agency per the MOU. The MOU, by the way, was a calculated payment, not our actual usage reading. So thank you. I think my time is up. Thank you, Ryan. And Please, Mayor uh, Bacanti, sorry, we don't have any raised hands from the public. So I just wanted to say that public comment is closed. I see Lisa's hand is raised and perhaps she can answer some of Ryan's Ryan. questions. Certainly, Mayor. Um, I think the first thing to note is that 
the city staff brings the warrant register typically to every council meeting. Um, because there was only a single meeting in December, um, this basically reflects what you would have seen at two different meetings. So that's why there are multiple payments to the same vendors um, because we're looking at sort of two sets of payments. Um, certainly, it appears for, as I look at it that um, the October payment was paid in the to the sheriff's department was paid and these bills have been paid was paid in the beginning of December, which means we got the bill in November for October and paid it accordingly. Um, then the next bill would have been paid um, when we got in early December the November bill. Um, and so that was paid. And again, you're seeing these all because we did not have a second meeting in December. So all these are rolled up together in one warrant register. Um, I can't speak to, well, I can speak to the special meeting. I think that was because we put the consent calendar on um, the early meeting that we had because we were trying to get through a lot of things. We knew we had a very long meeting night. And so the warrant register was put together with the regular consent calendar in an effort to free up the 630 meeting um, and take care of regular business. Um, I remember hearing something about a street light or traffic signal. There are some things that the city does pay for independently. I'd have to look into that $900 um, more specifically. I think that addresses sort of the larger questions. And certainly, um, as had been brought up before, the city is in, has no problem with cash flow. Um, the cash report is part of the mid-year. It will come before you at the next meeting and you will see that there is plenty of money in the city's bank accounts to cover all the necessary bills in the proper time. So I'm here if anybody has any specific questions, um, but other than that, it, those are my responses. Thank you, Lisa. Is there any further discussion on this matter? Would someone like to make a motion? I'll make yeah, Paul, a motion I will you. move to approve warrant demand numbers 64749 through 64948. I'm glad to second. Okay, we've got a motion, and that is uh, your, I'm going to characterize that as you're suggesting we pay warrant register number 695 in total. Uh, right? no. Yes. Thank okay. you, Paul. All right. We have a motion and second. Uh, Kelsey, will you take the roll? Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Urine? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that takes us to item 3B7. And I believe, was that? Uh, Bruce's Mayor Grisanti, that item was pulled by the council, but we have had a speaker sign up since that action was taken. If you're ready to hear them, I'm delighted to hear them. We'll hear from Ryan. You're on, Ryan. Um, okay, so 3B7 I submitted for, and can you remind me the title, please? It has to do the standard agreement with the Department of California Highway Patrol. Yes. Okay. So this item is um, unfortunately it includes something that we were previously not having to pay for, and that is for traffic control during emergencies or declared emergencies. And we've never had to pay for that um, from the state of California. That you know that they get paid from our income tax, our gas tax, our sales tax, and so forth. Now. Anticipating something in particular in contracting for it is another matter, I understand, but this is including something that is a funding shift and a, a burden on the city of Malibu, and it, it's almost setting a precedent because we shouldn't have to pay for it. And if you review the California Vehicle Code 2400.6, 
that item says only those things that are contracted for at the request of the city. There's nothing precludes the CHP from coming out here during a fire and directing or assisting traffic at our request then. But it's only if it's our request and if we enter into a contract for it in advance, like you're doing now, then we're on the hook for it. So I don't know why you'd be shooting yourself in the foot and, and taking on more financial liability for the state when they're the ones running the roadblocks. They like to run them at Topanga anyway, uh, because it's closer access to the West Valley Station and they're patrolling Topanga anyway, because it's a state road in their jurisdiction. But um, the issue is why should we pay for something that we don't have to, and we have been in practice in getting for free. Don't think you're going to direct them on uh, what they're going to do just because you're going to pay them back for doing whatever that is they're going to do anyway. We'll never be able to tell the CHP what to do. We've seen that in the last 28 years. So um, I think you should put this off and take that section out uh, that we have to pay for them during disasters. Because if anything, we'd be getting something like a, a a markdown reimbursement from the state, how ironic, from uh, having to um, co-fund part of these services and then get somewhat of a, an emergency reimbursement after the fact, you know, up to years later when we could be getting it, should be getting it, we should be jumping up and down and politically demanding that we receive the services of the CHP equally like everybody else. And again, the 2400.6 vehicle code section, I believe is on your uh, agenda for political um, recall at the state level. And I hope it is, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. That concludes public comment. Thank you. Bruce? Yes. Was this one of yours or was it Ryan's only? It may have been one of mine. Since there was a comment, I'll, I'll just, I didn't know if I needed to speak, but yeah, I, we have a contract with the Sheriff's Department. We have our general contract. We've got a supplemental contract. We've got this contract. As best I can tell, and I could be mistaken, the services that are being provided pursuant to this contract, if they're going to be provided, overlap services that the Sheriff's Department provides. I don't mean we're going to be paying for the same service choice, but they both provide the same types of services. Uh, I don't know that anyone has done an analysis of whether we're better off getting more of the services from the sheriff or more of the services from CHP. So this was just presented as here's a contract with the CHP. I didn't understand enough about it to know why I should be voting to approve it. That's why I asked that it be pulled. Thank you, Bruce. I asked some questions about it, and as I understood, this is a, a standby contract, which we may or may not use, and we have not used it all in the, in the past, and it's to give us flexibility. Uh, I see Steve reaching for his mute button. Uh, sorry to correct you, Mr. Mayor, but we, we have utilized it, uh, although sparingly. Uh, for example, we did use them back in uh, May for some additional um, uh, patrol services during the Memorial Day weekend. So it's basically when we can't get the uh, the people we hope, the amount of people we hope for from the sheriffs, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And I think Lisa can expand on that as well too. Lisa, please go ahead. Thank you, yeah. Lisa. Certainly. Um, and I was also gonna point out, I don't know that Elizabeth Shavelson has her raise hand feature, but she's the one who's been working on this contract. Um, and it has been for a while. We've been trying to put this in place. Liz, remind me how long it's taken. Council provided direction um, for this item in February of 2022, uh, 2020, excuse me. So we've been working with the, the state on the long-term agreement. Um, in the meantime, the city has used the sh short-term contract with, um, with the highway patrol for those holiday weekends that um, Steve mentioned. And, and so it wasn't really just 
for disasters. It was for when we had a hard time getting sheriff services. We knew we were going to need extra deployment in town. Um, we've also tried to use them, for example, when we were anticipating a PSPS. Um, we wanted to have this in place just in case um, we could make use of it. Um, they weren't always going to be available to us. That's the other caveat. Like just like the sheriffs, they're busy all over the county, um, and in case of the CHP, um, further regionally than that. But um, it's just a good thing to have in place in case we need it and um, can get extra help. Okay. Can we get a motion to? Uh, pass the standard agreement with the Department of California Highway Patrol. I so move. I'll second. We got a motion and a second. Kelsey, will you take the roll, please? Councilmember Kerr? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Beering? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. This takes us to item 3B11. And I, this was pulled also. Yes, we have two public speakers for this item. They are Richard Sussman and Ryan. We'll hear from Richard Sussman first. Thank you. Are you available, Mr. Sussman? If you can hear me. We can hear you. Um, give me one second. You caught me by surprise. My, let me get my print. Um, yeah, I, uh, um, I, I have not followed the previous discussions and debates about this particular cell tower issue. What I do want to comment on is the total lack of decent communication networks in Malibu. Every resident, I mean everyone, has had problems with poor cell coverage, and every one of us has complained about it. And everyone in this meeting knows this is true, and yet we continue to shoot ourselves in the foot by refusing to allow antennas around town. This application by Verizon should be approved. The NIMBY crowd should be thankful that Verizon is even still trying to get us a stronger cell signal. Why did it, they didn't just say, screw you, Malibu, we're trying to help you out there. If you don't want to be able to carry on a normal, uninterrupted telephone call, then adios, you're on your own. But they didn't, they're trying to put a tower up. The council needs to stop pandering to the lunatic fringe and make decisions based on what you know is best for the community as a whole. We need better cell coverage in Malibu. No one has, no one is going to get cancer from a cell antenna. And everyone will benefit from them, especially when we need them the most during disasters and emergencies. Be bold, my council members. Make a lasting, important, and positive decision here. Bring Malibu residents five bars on their telephones, especially when we need them the most. Uh, that's all I want to say about this. We need cell coverage out here and quit pandering to these people at you know, the NIMBY POV. We need them. Uh, thank you for your time. That's all I, I have on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stutzman. And next, we'll hear from Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Yes, I agree that you should uphold the appeal and deny this application. Um, the The general championing of wireless communications in Malibu has been a thing I've been promoting for the last 29 years. And that's not inconsistent with the recommended action here. The proposed facility, there's, there's no voice problem here of coverage, and that is what speakers generally relate to. They say, oh, my, my call got dropped somewhere. They don't even say what carrier they're with, you know, because we've got multiple carriers, still have four branded carriers. So this is a redundant facility, and it's to promote data transmission to uh, compete with land-based fiber and cable delivered internet service in particular. And um, in fact, the uh, wireless home 
internet is now prominently part of Verizon's uh, web page where they're trying to conquest these uh, dollars. And by the way, they don't have a franchise for the city of Malibu, so you won't really be getting much benefit other than possibly, and not for data, but possibly um, if the entire account of someone is billed, you get your 5% utility users tax. Well, you get that anyway. So, but this site is a poor location as was uh, mentioned and analyzed by the planning commission. And it's in front of a property that's in proposed transition. And yet there's vacant property, a parking lot on the other side of the street, for instance, where there are, are already multiple cellular communication, mini uh, lo um, microcells. In fact, most people won't even know where they are. Uh, I'm not talking about the one at Rambla at, near Adler's house, th those two, <laughs> those twin palms. That's not it. Uh, but this one was uh, not um, proposed to fill a gap in service coverage, uh, which is kind of what the prior speaker alluded to. Uh, this isn't really uh, the way to do that. Um, Verizon had the pick of all the poles on Pacific Coast Highway. They were the first carrier to Malibu. They solved the voice connection problem from one end of Malibu to the other on Pacific Coast Highway. And if there's a voice communications problem, it's because of a maintenance issue of Verizon of existing facilities, not this additional infill facility, which is obviously motivated for high profit data sales. And, and not for uh, voice or emergency or 911 communications. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. That concludes public comment on this item. Okay, the recommended action is that we adopt a resolution uh, granting the appeal, upholding the appeal and denying the coastal development permit. Is there anybody who wants to? Bruce, I see your hand. I wanted to make a motion that we adopt the resolution. We already voted to grant the appeal. This resolution simply memorializes it. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Kelsey, will you take the roll? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uri? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. That takes us to item 3B12. Do we have any members of the public to comment on that? Just confirming here, no, we don't have any public speakers for this item. Okay. Uh, do we know, did you pull this one, Bruce? Bruce, you're on. Okay. So I'm really surprised we don't have any public speakers on this one. Um, this is a proposal to lift the resolution, to rescind the resolution or terminate the resolution that we had approved a few months ago that prevents encampments anywhere in Malibu because of various um, fire danger. Um, drought's not over. You know, we're in a better position today than we were a month ago, but the drought is far from over. California is in a drought. We'll probably be in a drought for the next decade. Um, the entirety of Malibu remains classified by state officials as a very high fire hazard severity zone, the entirety of Malibu, every square inch, allowing encampments to resume in fire prone areas continues to pose a clear and present risk. It threatens an even greater risk if that were possible when the brush dries up again, as it will, unless and until the drought comes to an end. So, um, you know, unless the fire chief's gonna come here and tell us he doesn't believe that Malibu is a high fire danger anymore, just because one or two of the multiple factors we previously identified in support of the resolution have changed doesn't mean the emergency is over and I don't believe we should be ending the uh, resolution. Thank you, Bruce. Steve? Uh, yeah, I agree with that. It just, if, if you went outside last night, the Santa Ana winds were blowing, they were blowing all day today. There was a little fire up at Heather Cliff the other day. So I agree, This we should not be taking this off the, the plate. Uh, that, that fire danger is not over yet. Thank you, Steve. Mikey? I'd like to have Susan comment on this because I think there's some legal stuff involved. We already, we've already seen where the fire chief, I believe, has told us that 
certain areas we wanted to have as off limits, he wouldn't allow. So I think there's more to this than meets the eye. And I'd like uh, Susan to comment if possible. Yes. Um, I understand, you know, Bruce, uh, Council Member Silverstein and Yearing, I understand your position. Um, and it's a little bit tricky. I, I mean, I think the problem really comes down to the purpose of an emergency declaration. It's not meant to be a long-term state of being. It's, it's meant to be used when you have an extreme situation um, causing peril to the community, which we had last summer, you know, citing the, the low, you know, live fuel and moisture, which is no longer the case. And that was one of the driving factors. I know it wasn't the, all the factors. I mean, I guess you could liken it to, we also are in a very high risk area for an earthquake and we can have one any day, but we don't live in a state of emergency um, with the expectation we can have an earthquake. Um, and obviously I know that's not a really good parallel because fires are much more common than earthquakes, but the spirit of the, uh, the law for declaring emergencies is really just to use it during those extreme times. So it's best practice, at least in my whole career, it's encouraged to terminate, and it states in the law to terminate at the earliest possible time. And I'm not sure if it even serves a huge purpose for us because we do still have the very high fire hazard severity ordinance that we can use. We do have the camping ordinance that we've adopted. We have the nuisance code. So we have a lot of tools at our hands. So it doesn't mean that we're not able to manage the situation, but as is usually stated that we are now in a position of being able to handle it with normal protective measures. So that's what I, I would say about this. Thank you, I see Karen's hand. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, Susan, I, I'll just ask you um, regarding the state of, of local emergency. My assumption uh, is that this can and will be revisited when the fuel moisture level drops below a threshold level. Yeah, and so it may be a seasonal item. Absolutely, you can do that. Yeah. And, and I guess I'd be curious to see if John Cotty has any thoughts on this as well as our legal counsel. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, I, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, Ms. Duenas is correct. The government code says that you should remove the local emergency when conditions that led to the emergency no longer warrant the action that you're taking. So um, it'd be prudent to terminate it. It can be revisited anytime. If, if conditions warrant, it can be revisited in January. Um, it's just a question of, of the local condition that warranted the emergency up until even a few weeks ago, and then changing the, you know, the changing conditions that occurred through December, those conditions might abate, and you might be back to a situation where you need this declaration. It's prudent to remove it. That's what the code requires when conditions don't, don't warrant it anymore. That would seem to be the case now after eight inches of rain and some, some information from the fire department. Mikey? Um, as I remember, we had this discussion when we actually passed this, and I just think it's, you know, it always feels like an emergency. I have to agree. So my my question is, uh, just to understand the law better, if we don't remove it, wh wh where do we put ourselves there? And I know it has to do with the outside agencies, right? The police and fire. I I don't know. I mean, I think it's really more, it, it, it doesn't really have usefulness now because it would be difficult to engage the police powers. I mean, because it entitles the city to have, you know, uh, additional powers in an emergency in order to address an extreme situation. And if we were to try to employ those types of powers right now, it could be argued that we're overstepping the spirit of this law and that we should have terminated it. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Bruce? 
So I, I appreciate what Susan and John have said. I think reasonable minds can differ on whether we still have an emergency or whether the emergency is just now problematic, but not an urgent emergency. I think that the emergency clearly was worse before the, um, the, the rain, but that doesn't change the fact that we still have one. So, I mean, I, I, I think there's a reasonable view in either direction. I think our first priority is public safety. And until it's clear that we are no longer in a high fire hazard severity zone, either because the environment changes or because we develop systems that will better deal with fire as, for example, one that was discussed earlier tonight, I think that this is still perfectly appropriate. And there's no rule that says that we are out of danger many months a year. We, we are in a difficult place. Insurance companies are, won't even insure people that live here because of that. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, apparently, uh, a live fuel moisture of 60% or lower is considered critical. And we find ourselves in the wonderful position of having the fire department tell us that as of December 24th, the live fuel moisture has increased to approximately 90%. So it, it makes it, it's still not safe to camp in our hillsides and have fires. That's illegal. It's illegal on other reasons as well. I don't think we're giving up all our our uh, tools if we take this off and then are responsive and put it back on as soon as the live fuel moisture drops again. But I don't know what, what is the pleasure of the council? I mean, I think since it was made in a state of emergency, we kind of need to just visit it as we need to, just to be within what appears to be the law. So until I learn different, I mean, I'll vote to support this. I'll make the motion, but you know, I I know Susan will be right on top of it too. So I want to make sure we keep in the spirit of the law so that we have impact when we need it. Okay. We have a motion and a second to terminate the state of local emergency by adopting resolution number 22-02. Kelsey, will you take the roll? Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Ewing? Uh, no. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? No. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that takes us to uh, item number 4A, and I would like very much to have a short break before we commence that. So if I can have you all meet me back here in 10 minutes, I would be most appreciative. And if you could turn off your microphones and your cameras. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay, we are back. We're four out of five are. Five out of five. Okay, we're at item number 4A. Do we have any members of the public or we do the presentation first from staff? I believe Richard's trying to give us his, there you go. Thank you, Richard. We can provide you with the presentation. Uh, if uh, we have our housing element consultant, John Douglas here with us this evening, John will be presenting this and explaining what changes have occurred uh, since you've last seen this. Thank you. Welcome, John. Thank you, Mayor, Council members. Good evening. Uh, uh, I have a few slides that I would like to walk us through uh, to brief you on the housing element update. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, what we are asking tonight is for you to receive our presentation and also conduct a public hearing. This is a general plan amendment. Uh, and we're asking if it's your pleasure to adopt a resolution approving the housing element uh, that includes uh, certain findings that are spelled out in your staff report. Uh, on the next slide, I'd like to just summarize the process that we've gone through over the past about a year working on this housing element update. Uh, starting last June, we began a series of public meetings. Tonight is, I believe, the fifth public meeting that the city's conducted uh, over the last six or seven months. Uh, last summer, we kicked off with a public workshop followed by study sessions uh, by the Planning Commission and by your council. Uh, after that, uh, council study session in August, we submitted a draft housing element to the State Department of Housing and Community Development that you'll recall from our previous meetings is one of the important steps of this process. Uh, and during September and October, the state reviewed our housing element. And then in October, they sent us a letter with their findings and recommendations. And so uh, we went to work uh, reviewing that state letter findings. Uh, we prepared a revised draft housing element that was uh, reviewed by your planning commission in November at a public hearing. And then at that hearing, the planning commission adopted a resolution recommending that your council adopt the housing element. So that's very briefly how we got to where we are today. And if we could go to the next slide, I'd like to just uh, briefly refresh your memory on uh, our previous workshops and what the housing element contains. Uh, the, as you recall, the housing element is a required part of your general plan. And the reason why Malibu and every other city in Southern California is doing this right now is because state law requires housing elements to be updated every eight years. Uh, this uh, time period that we're working on now extends from 2021 out to the year 2029, and it's sometimes referred to as the sixth housing element planning cycle because this is the sixth time uh, since the state law was comprehensively updated back in 1980. Uh, you've heard us uh, use the term certification of the housing element. The housing element is very unusual. Uh, as a, a very unusual part of your general plan because of the extensive legal requirements and the extensive state oversight uh, that the state legislature <clears throat> has established for housing elements. Uh, as you well know, there have been uh, extensive changes to state law just within the last few years because of the housing crisis. We are required to submit draft housing elements to HCD before they are adopted by your council. We're required, the council is spe uh, specifically required to consider the findings of HCD in your 
deliberations and decision whether to adopt this housing element. And the, the, uh, the term certification refers to when a city receives a letter from the state uh, expressing the opinion that the housing element uh, adequately complies with all the requirements of state law. That's very important and cities try very hard to get that certification from the state because it expands the opportunities for grant funds for cities that have a certified housing element and it also helps to provide uh, some uh, legal support for the city's entire land use planning program. Uh, let's go to the next slide and I want to just very briefly summarized what's in this this thick document as you recall there's a, a lot of information a lot of statistics um, it's a very dense document uh, the most important part in my opinion of the housing element is chapter 5 section 7.5 which is the housing plan this is the section of the housing element that contains the goals, policies, and implementation programs, things that the city intends to do over the next eight years in order to address housing issues in the city of Malibu. Since you last saw the housing element uh, at your public workshop last summer, there has been one appendix added to the housing element, and that's Appendix E, uh, the contributing factors to fair housing issues. And this is as a result of one of the comments from State HCD in their review letter. Uh, what I would like to do is go to the next slide and highlight the particular programs where there is some change called for in current city policies or regulations. Uh, most of the programs in the housing element are continuation of existing uh, policies and programs from the previous planning housing element, but there are a few things that have changed with regard to state requirements for that cities have to amend their regulations in order to conform to new state requirements. Those changes have to do with accessory dwelling units, as you know, and uh, have been uh, have discussed recently. There's also changes to state density bonus law that will require uh, an adjustment to the city's regulations. There is a change in city regulations as a result of the streamlining provisions of Senate Bill 35 from a few years ago. That's the law that requires cities to expedite the permit review for certain housing projects if they are not keeping pace with their housing needs as, uh, as assigned through the, the ARENA, the Regional Housing Needs Assessment. And then there are a number of other changes that are all related to special housing needs and fair housing, specifically with regard to parking standards for emergency shelters, for some uh, a new thing called low barrier navigation centers, which are uh, an emergency shelter that also provides some social services to the clients, and also some changes to regulations regarding supportive housing. All of those will be amendments to the municipal code and the LCP that will come back to you at a future meeting. They're not on your agenda tonight, but those will be code amendments and LCP amendments that we will bring back to you and they will have a separate uh, public hearing process with the planning commission and with your council. Uh, let's go to the next slide and I will wrap up just by summarizing what the next steps in this process, if it is your pleasure to adopt this housing element this evening, then we are required to submit it to state HCD for a second review as an adopted document. And then uh, in about, a, about two months from now, we will get back a second letter telling us if we have hit the mark and addressed all of the state's prior comments or whether uh, there are still uh, unsettled issues uh, from the state's perspective. And then this is an eight year plan. And so, as I mentioned, there will be municipal code and LCP amendments coming back to you uh, that are required by state law. And then uh, the other programs in the housing element uh, will continue out to the year 2029. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Uh, Karen Fair, I see your hand. Are the speakers Paul? Sorry, is it my turn? I think it is. Okay, great. Um, Mr. Douglas, Douglas, when you're ready, you do have a public speaker. After oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, question. let's wait. Sorry, let's Karen. do that first. Let's go ahead. Okay, Please. you have just one speaker for this item, Jamie Francis Wendell. Hi, Jamie, are you available? I am. Thank you, Council. Council, I just wanted to remark, and I wanted to thank a couple of Council members, uh, Council Member Pearson and Ferrer. Really, thank you for your comments. I stayed online for uh, almost three hours for that reason. I really do appreciate your efforts with recognizing that state law is requiring, uh, as John Douglas referred to, I've already been with three iterations since 1986. It's now 2022. Now we're looking at the forecast of 2029. I mean, the city was incorporated in 1991. It is 30 years and 30 plus years now with no contingency with affordable housing. And why I wanted to make this remark is that just to rebut what Councilmember Silverstein said, I did not say the city is full of millionaires. What I did say is because of that vacuum, which Councilmember Pearson alluded to because of the tranquility and the desirability, it attracted many millionaires. And in doing so, it left a vacuum for Airbnbs for a lot of these homes that now are celebrity driven or attract a lot of international money that contributes nothing to the city. I didn't say that the city was made of only millionaires. It just had a wide variety. And I feel bad for the people that were burned out because of the Woolsey fire. However, that does not excuse that the city does not have any affordable housing. That is ridiculous. I do want to be part of the member and community. I was priced out of Santa Monica because of these landlords. And yet for council member Silverstein to say, well, I want things too. I can't have them. You are blase about it and you're going to vote against it regardless because you don't believe there should be affordable housing, but the state says otherwise. John Douglas said that the city has to have some kind of comprehensive plan, which you have failed to do. Now it is state law that basically said, you must do it, you must comply. For you to only have people of a higher income valuation is not appropriate. You should have a variety. Santa Monica does, and yet you had the school system combined, and they said, look it, with Malibu, a lot of the students don't need to go to public school if they can afford private school, and that's what the ambiguity and the disparity is. And the same thing goes for housing. You cannot have a, dis a disparity of housing. You must complete this process and allow people like me to finally have our objectives. And yet you go through Community Corps of Santa Monica. That's fine. I have a Section 8 voucher. I should be able to find a landlord who says, I will take your Section 8 voucher, or that I should, based on state law, not refuse you from renting one of my available units up to the coast highway. But I don't know why there is no contingency in place. Do you think that after 30 years, a city would have a contingency plan with affordable housing and not worry about people who have money, who don't contribute to your society, Jamie, who don't pay taxes? that's your time. Yes, thank, thank you. you. And we do have a raised hand from Joe Drummond, so we'll hear from her next. Thank you, Joe. Are you available? Hi, yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, great. Um, I just, I had a question about um, the ADUs. I, I heard that they were difficult to build in Malibu because we are in a very high, high fire hazardous zone and that they are forbidden or something. And I just like clarity on this. And if there is any space in Malibu allocated for affordable housing, we need more information and to work with, a, I think I sent emails before about a, a company that um, actually does the senior housing or affordable housing on a regular basis. So if we have land or we have um, some kind of uh, funds for this, then it can be done. It can be, it can happen. I, I just wanted to also say that, like, if if the city planning department wasn't so sorry pro development, and it's which is dividing the city council, but it will hurt the thing that us families in Malibu want the most, which is school separation. So by supporting mega mansions, hotels, motels versus preserving Malibu and its more affordable housing options, 
this will not attract more families here. Big Rock, where I live, is one of the only affordable options for families left in Malibu, but we have not fully over, because we have not fully overdeveloped here, but some of you on the council and city staff are trying to change this, like the recently approved first variance factor of safety in Big Rock for a home that's 90% bigger in TDSF than all the other homes on Inland Lane, and it's being dug into the unstable cliffside. So that's going to be appealed to the Coastal Commission, but it would set a terrible precedent here. So this all started when Reva Feldman was city manager and encouraging the rubber stamping of more development that comes through the planning department, especially commercial development and mega mansions. So we did report this, this project to the attorneys of the Wagner case because of the first planner on it recommended denial and it was swiftly removed and replaced with someone aggressively pro-approving the project. It just didn't make sense, but they refused to interview the former planners involved and they said they needed, because they said they needed proof of bribery, et cetera, but not following the codes is a practice that is getting too familiar in the planning department and it just needs to stop. Um, I mean, Big Rock has a commitment to sacrifice urban and suburban conveni conveniences in order to protect the environment and lifestyle and preserve unaltered natural resources and rural characteristics as stated in our vision statement. And we hope other communities will join us. And that's just my two cents about the overdevelopment is causing the prices to go crazy. But anyway, I think you guys know that <laughs> I stand for that. So thanks very much. Thank you, Joe. I see that Ryan has joined us. Yes, we can hear from him next. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I wanted to, uh, in contrast to one of the prior speakers, um, to have the staff be sure to explain, and maybe it'd be the city staff and not necessarily the consultant's burden to do this, but the city's under no obligation to go buy land or construct any new uh, properties and then lease them out at quote affordable rates, which would be an incredible uh, public subsidy program. That's not envisioned, it's not legal, and that it is simply the city designating or facilitating some type of um, application to do that. And I would like a, a very uh, good analysis and comment from maybe the city treasurer or from Lisa Sogor um, on just how they um, would ever expect uh, a developer to come to Malibu and buy up millions of dollars of land and somehow come out with an equation where they would not be losing their shirts. This is um, uh, somewhat of a joke scenario. Uh, we have to follow it uh, because we're a city in the state of California, but it's not practical uh, given the landslides, the fire risk, and the cost of land, and that uh, just because it's been 30 years and somebody who wants to pick this community to live in affordably because it's a nice place to live, there needs to be a bigger sacrifice than just showing up and saying, I'm here. Yeah, I'm sorry to say that, but real estate is uh, what it is, and it's, it's priced accordingly. And the concept that the city has an obligation to provide um, structures at a certain price point. Um, let's get that out of the way real quick. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Mayor, I don't see any other raised hands. I don't have any more speaker sign up. So that concludes public comment. I think I'll recognize Karen Ferrer again. Thanks, Paul. Um, I First thing I wanna do is thank uh, everybody that worked on this report. Uh, I spent a long time reading it. I made a lot of notes. I Maybe I'm a nerd. I found it extremely interesting, uh, and I want to acknowledge the work that has gone into it. Um, I won't. I won't get into correcting some of the statements that have been made or, or, or questions that have been posed that are not based in reality. Uh, but what I would like to do is make a motion to adopt Resolution 2267. I'll second that motion. And we're open for discussion. We have a motion and a second. Bruce? 
Okay, so to Mr. Wendell's great surprise, I support approving this. Um, you know, I am a strong proponent of a free market society, which is how this country works for the most part. And um, subject to legal constraints, that's the way I believe it ought to be. This is a legal constraint that we're required to live with. So we're being told by our expert, Mr. Douglas, who I, by the way, I appreciate all the work you've done. I have watched the workshops. I, I, I think you've made this very simple to understand and easy to follow. So thank you for all that work. And uh, I understand this is, this is how we comply with this legal requirement. Uh, I personally don't like the legal requirement. Other people may love it, but you know, it is what it is. And because it is what it is, we have to deal with it. But we don't have to go beyond what we're legally required to do. And I understand that we're doing what we're required to do here. Um, the only criticism I have of what's before us, this has nothing to do with the plan itself, is the resolution, I think, has too strong a statement about why CEQA doesn't apply. It's very common in the resolutions we're presented that, that's categorically and in very strong terms declare that CEQA doesn't apply. I don't think we need to do it as strong as it does. I doubt that anyone's going to have the appetite to go through the words with me tonight. So because of that, I'm not going to stand on that objection. But um, I, I think it would be helpful before these things are published to have an opportunity for the council members to look at them and provide comments. I mean, I know we have the opportunity after the agenda is published, but then it becomes a matter of having to tinker with something that's already been made public. I, I think it would be very helpful if we were given a couple days on something like this to look at it, suggest whatever revisions we might have, which the city's obviously, the staff's free to accept or reject, but that way we don't have to be um, proposing revisions to something that's already been made public. But with that said, um, I, I support this. Thank you, Bruce. I see Mikey's hand. Thank you, Mayor. And, uh, I want to thank John and staff for the huge work on this. I, too, found it, a, again, yet again, a fascinating read, even though I've read it before. I wanted to reread it from start to finish to just get the flow of all the changes that were made, even though they were actually not that many. Um, I just have a few kind of clarifying questions. Um, legally, do ADUs, I think I know the answer, but can or do ADUs help us make progress towards our arena numbers? Mayor and council, yes, they do. And that depends, but we have to track the rate and who they're rented to, correct? Is that how that works? Just in themselves, they don't, right? Because you could rent them at some higher rate. They have to be rented at a certain rate, or is that, I, I just want to make sure I understand how that works. ADUs are not required to be rented at any set rate or to be affordable, uh, but every year cities report their uh, their housing approvals and their building permit issuance. And so ADUs are reported to the state. And we, um, we try to estimate as best we can what the affordability level of an ADU is. Uh, but mm. it's, uh, it's, it's staff's estimate or it's the, the owner's um, information that they may provide to the city as part of their building permit application. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. That's helpful. And I know there's a formula, but I love a, just a couple comments on the number of ADUs that are in the plan. I mean, I know there's been worries, the new state ADU law from certain members in the community and on the planning commission that ADUs are going to flood Malibu. But the number here is 32 for the cycle, which seems small to me, but, and I just would like comments on that. It, it does seem like, I don't know, seems, it feels like more would be built. So where does that number come from? Yes, the, it's a pretty simple answer. The state tells us how many ADUs we can claim credit for, and it's based on the, the last three years. So it's an average of the last three years projected forward. Okay, you know what? Okay, that totally makes sense. And if it was in there, I apologize for missing it. Um, also, there's something I'd never heard of, and maybe I, I don't know how I missed this, but what is the Patriot Homes Overlay Condominium Project? I actually have no idea. 
Certainly. That's actually the condos that, uh, gosh, they're, um, I think now it's called Carbon Beach Terrace, uh, not the Carbon Beach Terrace homes that are behind um, the- Talking about those really expensive the, condos there? The eight condos that I recall for the longest time watching just that faux wall, if you recall, on PCH that looked like a fake- you know, mountainside, and then they built yep. the condos, and I think we're on developer number three. I think they might have sold at this point, uh, but it, it they were renamed that, the Carbon Beach Terrace. Okay, and, and it was the Patriot Homes Overlay Condominium Project at some time. Did it not know was that. prior to Cityhood, uh, I believe, that the subdivision, and uh, the way it uh, kind of fell into this was that there was a condition of approval, which I think was part of a settlement agreement uh, that uh, Christy Hogan's office worked out in the early 90s, where they could be built and uh, so much money when the units got sold had to be placed in an affordable housing account. Right. Okay. I got it. I got it. And John, where did the added language for the emergency shelter section come from? Is that something the state recommended? There's a whole new addition on emergency shelters. What, can you explain that? Yes, all the material that you see in strikeout underline in the housing element is our changes in response to comments from the state. Okay, so, but how did you come up with that language added? It seemed very much like a formula, is that a standard formula that other cities are following? Uh, it, it probably is standard language. Uh, I'd have to uh, turn to that page and see exactly what it says. 7-40. Okay, hold on one sec, please. Okay. Uh, I believe, uh, if I'm looking at the right section, I believe that's the code language in the city's municipal code and for the regulations oh. uh, for emergency shelters. Okay, okay, and it just wasn't in there in the last rendition. Uh, that's right. Yeah, they oh. wanted more information, more details. Okay, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. So I've always, I've always, I think when I first got involved with the city as a planning commissioner, first year as a planning commissioner was the last cycle. And um, it was hard to understand because I knew none of it seemed to really make sense in reality. But I understand that some of this isn't reality. It's not requiring things to be built. It's not requiring us to help developers. It's not requiring a, a lot of things. But it seems like the, the state is trying to force another level of compliance, as I understand it. And you mentioned... We get legal support from an approved plan. What does that mean exactly? That was a, you used the word legal support. Yeah, uh, I, I'll take a cut at that. But since I'm not an attorney, I'll, I'll defer to Mr. Cotty if he wants to clarify anything I say. Uh, there, there is a provision in, in state law that says if the state uh, issues an opinion that your housing element does comply with state law, then that conveys what the lawyers call a rebuttable presumption of validity if someone challenges you in court. So that's, uh, that, that's one of the advantages of having that state certification. Okay, that, that's a great explanation. And, and, and just maybe to say it in public, um, are there penalties of, for not making headway on your regional housing needs assessment numbers? At, uh, at this time, the only penalty, if you want to use that term, is that uh, a city could be required to offer fast track permit processing for certain developments. But now that that fast track permit processing is also um, uh, different within the coastal zone. So it doesn't exempt uh a project from having to go through the coastal development permit process. There, over the years, there have been discussions in Sacramento about possibly some stronger penalties or withholding of gas tax revenues, that kind of thing, if cities do not obtain 
state certification of the housing element, but none of those, there's no penalties like that on the books today. Okay, that's what I thought. And la last thing is, um, there's a statement here on the, I, I don't know if it's on the goals or whether we're complying with, with this agreement, these statements. Number one, that we ensure adequate sites for new housing for persons of all income levels. Two, we encourage and facilitate the development of affordable housing. Three, we can serve and improve the existing affordable housing stock. Four, analyze and remove governmental restraints on new housing development. Five, promote equal housing opportunities. Six, preserve assisted housing. And seven, affirmatively further fair housing. So this plan is supposed to incorporate those comments, correct? That's right. And those are all requirements of state law. Right. But not the same thing as just, I'm trying to say this kind of for myself and the public, not the same thing as requiring us to go out and pursue building to make that happen. Yeah, and, and maybe if I could just take 20 seconds and elaborate to, to emphasize what has been said before. State law does not require cities to build any housing or to fund affordable housing. What state law focuses on is cities using their powers to adopt plans and regulations that that enable housing to be built. Yeah. Okay, I just really wanted to try and clarify that for everyone because it's this is a, it's a big document and I think, um, you know, it can be hard to grasp for a lot of people, including myself, right all at once. So thanks again, John. I really appreciate the work you've done on this. Okay. I see no hands, so I'm going to call the question. We have a motion and a second to adopt the plan, I believe. So Kelsey, would you be kind enough to take the roll? Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. That takes us to item 4B, which is, uh, pardon me? Coming that we had lost Steve, but he's back. That, take us, that takes us to item 4B, which is a, the recommended action is to continue this to the February 14th, 2022 regular city council meeting. This will be our Valentine's Day present. So we can't open it yet. So uh, is there a motion to continue the item or how do we handle that? I'll move to continue the item. <laughs> I'll second. Motion and second to continue the item to February 14th, 2022, regular city council meeting. Mayor yep. Proton, I'm sorry, are you ready? I'm ready to take the roll unless there's a member of the public that wanted to address us on this. No, no speaker sign up since it's just- Thank you so much. Mayor Proton Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. That takes us up to item 5A, which is a consideration of the resumption of in-person meetings. And uh, we're gonna get an update on the current state and county regulations. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, again, I did provide um, some comments in my city manager's report regarding um, the current issue that we're seeing um, with COVID and, and the very high rate of community transmission that is currently being reported by uh, uh, officials, both in LA County and of course throughout the state and, and the nation uh, due to the Omicron uh, variant, uh, which of course has been uh, determined to be rather, rather contagious uh, and has led to a large increase um, in new cases. Um, just wanted to note for council in terms of uh, new new regulations, uh, the state uh, did extend uh, its requirement or its mandate uh, that all persons, regardless regardless of vaccination status, uh, wear masks when they are indoors. 
the state has extended that uh, mandate now to February 15th. Uh, they had originally established it in December uh, with a January um, ending date, but uh, subsequently extended that out to 15th of February. Um, also, um, since my last report, the uh, uh, state has also come out with the new rules uh, regarding uh, masks uh, and the types of masks that employers must provide to their employees. Uh, so we now know employers are now required to provide an N95 type of mask or equivalent uh, at no cost to the employees. So. Um, no longer uh, enough to simply have your, you know, your cloth mask. Um, employers are now required to provide those and um, require employees to wear those type of masks when they are uh, uh, indoors at the workplace. Um, so obviously we are in a rather significant surge right now, uh, not too far off from what we had seen uh, a year ago with COVID. Of course, the good news, as we all know, is that uh, a large percentage of the population is now uh, fully vaccinated and you know, many people are getting their boosters. Uh, so the, um, the, the threat to, uh, to life is not as great as it was, uh, but obviously we're, we are seeing this, this high rate of transmission right now. Um, so again, before council tonight, uh, as we bring this on as a, as a regular item, uh, just so that council has an opportunity to uh, weigh in and discuss uh, and give direction to staff if you are desiring to um, go back to um, some form of meetings other than how we are doing it right now. Uh, again, you do have the option of going back to in-person meetings um, or some hybrid um, equivalent. Uh, we simply are asking the council give us enough time uh, to be able to prepare for that should council wish to make that change. Could have to answer any questions. Thank you, Steve. Do we have any public comments? Yes, we have one speaker signed up for this item. We'll hear from Norman Haney. Mr. Haney, are you available? Norm? Yes, I am. Very yes, good. I am. First of all, I want to uh, offer you all uh, a good evening and I hope that your new year is uh, a happy one and more successful than uh, than the last year. Uh, I am strongly in support of in-person meetings and I think that we can take the necessary precautions to protect people. We can ensure that people have been fully vaccinated before they're entered into the council chambers. Uh, we can make sure that they're masked. We can make sure that uh, uh, that there's six foot spacing. Uh, we can make sure that there's two or three different microphones so one can be cleaned uh, when a um, when another public speaker comes to the dais to make a comment. Um, we can put plexiglass between the city council members so that uh, if they can't sit six feet apart um, or they, they'd rather not wear a mask, they're 20 feet away from the microphone. I mean, people are going to basketball games. They're going to restaurants. There, um, and I went to a restaurant the other day. They wouldn't let me in unless I showed that I was fully vaccinated, which I showed. It was uh, um, it was BJ's actually, and I, I really don't understand why we can't move forward uh, and have these types of regulations in place. Uh, so that we can have in-person meetings. Questions can be asked uh, directly uh, to the applicant uh, or to the people that are opposing the project. Uh, I just think it's a better way to conduct business. Those are my comments. Thank you very much for the opportunity to say them. And again, Happy New Year. Thank you, Norm. That was our only speaker sign up, and I don't see any raised hands, so that concludes public comments.
Okay, I see Bruce's hand raised. You have the floor. What a, what a surprise, right? Um, so I appreciate Norm's comments. He's, if nothing consistent, he's been saying the same thing now for six months maybe. Um, I had hoped, I think I expressed the views at December 13, I'd hoped that when we came back at the beginning of the year, we might be in a better position. We don't seem to be. If anything, things are, seem to be worse today than they were a month ago. I have zero confidence that when you get 20 or 30 people together, much less more than that, that they will all follow the rules. I've yet to see that happen anywhere since this crisis began. Uh, people don't wear their masks right. People don't agree to stay distant like they're supposed to. Uh, we're just not ready. So it's unfortunate, but we're just not there yet. That's my comments. Thank you very much, Bruce. I don't see any hands, so I'm going to jump in. I, I am hearing that the uh, South Africa, where this started, the wave has already peaked, and uh, the number of infections, because everybody who's going to get it has already had it, seem to be going down. And I guess we will watch them and and Israel and see what uh, the people who are unfortunate enough to catch it first. Are, are doing and how the, this is going for them. Uh, I actually went to a family wedding on uh, New Year's Day. Uh, they, they had us uh, take, be tested before we showed up and, be, and provide proof of vaccination. And, uh, you know, there were over 100 people there and it, it uh, you know, and that is now uh, 10 days after, it's nine days ago and my temperature hasn't risen or anything. So that's, that's good. And I would love to feel that we can do city council meetings again, but I don't think that the state's rules are gonna be encouraging us to do that for a while yet. Mr. Uring, I see your hand is raised. I will, I will make a motion to continue these uh, we're supposed to receive re receive it consider options i'm going to make a motion that we continue doing what we're doing i'll second the motion so we have a motion and a second to continue with the status quo and we will uh, i guess that means we'll address it again in a month's time or something similar to that or whenever conditions change we can bring it back in about a month or so yeah Okay. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Kelsey, will you take the roll, please? Councilmember Yuri? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carry. Okay. That should take us to Item 6A, the- Now 6B, 5B. I'm sorry, you're right. I wrote, uh, I made a note on uh, in the wrong place. Thank you for straightening me out. Okay. Amazingly enough, I don't seem to have 5B. Oh yeah, here it is. Sorry. Okay, this is a report on the status update on temporary restaurant recovery program and temporary signage permitted under urgency ordinances. Who will be making, I guess Richard's gonna report to us. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. I just would like to give you a quick update on where we are in implementing the two ordinances that were passed by the council. Uh, one of those ordinance was uh, ordinance 465U, which was passed uh, June of 2020, which allowed for restaurants to relocate seating from inside to outside in uh, outdoor areas such as parking spaces. And then a secondary or second uh, ordinance that was passed in September of 2020 
which was uh, Ordinance 471, which allowed for the installation of temporary signage, uh, some of which was signage that is typically prohibited under our existing sign uh, code. And the, like I mentioned, the purpose tonight, this is just a reporting. Um, we are more than uh, glad to take any comments that come from the council. Uh, but to report to you in terms of the restaurants, we have issued a total of 17 permits to various restaurants throughout the city. Uh, there have been mentioned uh, concerns that there has been a major loss of parking throughout the city. I did have code enforcement go out and look at that. We approved 17 permits, which based off those permits allowed for 51 parking spaces uh, to be utilized. Currently, only 22 parking spaces are being utilized for outdoor dining areas, so far less than what was approved, it's below half. And also, we have not received any complaints about these uh, restaurants operating outdoors. The complaints that we've received about food service outdoors, um, whether it be food or wineries, it turns out that they were operations that were not permitted by the city. The temporary commercial sign regulations uh, that were put in place by the council, we have not issued any permits. Uh, I know that we have explained to uh, businesses in the city what this uh, regulation is. Currently, it's at no cost to them to obtain a sign permit. We're more interested in getting this documented so that it will be, uh, I think, easier for us to uh, come and clean up once the council uh, decides that the local state of emergency is no longer in effect and that these ordinances uh, are no longer in effect. Uh, but we'd we'll like to report to the council that uh, we have not issued any temporary sign permits. However, uh, my thoughts on this, if the, you know, if the council agrees to it or provides other direction, would be that we could perform a sweep of the city to look for these signs, to document it. Uh, we could do something like that in the near future, or we could do something like that once the council uh, has determined that these regulations are no longer in place, we could then have code enforcement doing a sweep of the city. Also, when the regulations are going to be no longer in place, uh, the way that the ordinance is currently written, that's Ordinance 465 for the temporary restaurant uh, actions in, in, in the outdoor areas, uh, the current writing on the ordinance is that we give the restaurants up to uh, 72 hours to remove whatever uh, development or structures they have put in the parking areas. My only comment on that is that if if we're looking like we are getting towards the, the, the future where we're going to be removing this, I do think it would be helpful if we tried to give a bit more of an advanced warning. Uh, some of the permits, I, I forget the name of the restaurant, it escapes me, but it's in the former Nobu space. They actually have kind of a tent-like structure, so we just want to make certain that those folks have enough time to, to call the company, because I'm assuming that there's going to be quite a rush <laughs> to remove all of this, uh, so workers may be busy, but to make certain that uh, arrangements have been made to remove these items. And at this time, too, it's only been talk. Some restaurants have approached the the planning department asking if there could be a permanent change to the ordinances to, to facilitate more outdoor eating. While we're not seeing an issue with parking, as I mentioned, it, it's been very low. Uh, the concerns that we have as a staff with this expanded service area is that one, these folks would need to modify their conditional use permits. And then the second issue, other than parking, of course, for the service area is wastewater capacity. Uh, that is something that would uh, some thought would need to be given to uh, because expanding the seating area would put an additional low on wastewater systems and of particular concern would be in the civic center area where those parcels do not uh, uh, have their own wastewater treatment system so they just don't have the luxury of coming to the city with a proposal for a larger system. But I'm available for any questions. And as I mentioned, the purpose of coming to you this evening was just to let you know how the two ordinances have been implemented over the past 
uh, coming up on uh, will be coming up on two years. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Karen, I see your hand. Mayor Grisanti, I just want to note that you don't have any public speakers for this item. Elsie, I want to apologize for not asking. So please no forgive me. No apology necessary. Thank you for saving me yet again. Karen, I see your hand. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, this, I think, you know, just in our quest to try to help businesses through the pandemic, um, this is such a small thing, I, I, I think, and it's had such a low impact. And I think there's every reason to continue it. And, and Richard offered the option of doing the sweep. Uh, as this continues, I think based on everything we know about staff capacity, uh, I would suggest that we take up uh, the second option offered to us, and that's to do a sweep after this ordinance is rescinded. So I'm moving to uh, uh, receive and file and uh, think about that sweep after it's rescinded, whenever that is. Thank you, Karen. Mikey? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, this has been an obviously unprecedented time for the world, <laughs> including Malibu. I think the temporary sign ordinance made sense at the time because it was just such a, everything just felt so bizarre. I mean, it was just, everything was out of control for a while. And the fact, if, if nobody's using it, you know, great, I guess it can sit there or we can rescind it. If no one's using it, it doesn't seem to make much sense. I haven't noticed anyone using it, but then again, I haven't really, you know, forensically looked. As far as the outside dining, I think a couple of things. I think it's you know, and I'm no scientist and even scientists don't seem to know exactly, but I think it's likely that this is with us for a long time. And my guess, if I, had, and I'm guessing, and that means nothing, is that this, this virus is going to morph into a bad flu that's with us a long time and we get our regular vaccine and, you know, it kills old people and the people that aren't up for it. I, I don't think it's going away. I hope I'm wrong. So, but I do think coming through this, that the one thing that's obvious that we knew and already before this virus is people do like dining outdoors. And I don't think people, even as we get past this, are going to be really in a hurry to go indoors, you know, if, while it's around at all. And, I, you know, it's, it's, you know, people like our family where we take care of, and today was an issue of two people that are over 90 years old. You know, we just cannot, we can't catch this and take care of them. It's not going to work. I'm not worried about myself. So I uh, I have, and I've said this before, you know, publicly, I'll say it again. I have talked to Trevor about finding a path forward for some restaurants. And, and of course, it can't have impacts, um, but uh, to find a path forward to keep some or all of their outdoor space, every restaurant's different. It's not like we've taken up part of CC PCH to do this. Um, I think the capacity issue is the big is a big one. Parking's a big one. But I noticed there's a few restaurants where it's just kind of better. <laughs> um, and not to increase capacity or anything like that. So I don't know. We're we're a ways from that. But I think being in sunny Southern California, if this gives us the opportunity to have some of our favorite restaurants have some seats outside and there's no impact, it doesn't bother me at all. And those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. Bruce? Thanks, Paul. So I, I pretty much agree with everything that's been said. Um, I never understood the reason for the need for the signs. Apparently, the owners of the establishments didn't see it either. So that, that's cool. The outdoor seating, though, you know, a lot of just like businesses have learned that people can work remote. It actually works real well for some professions. I think this is just a change that is good. Um, why not have more outdoor dining? So I, I would favor looking into how we can accomplish allowing this to continue indefinitely. Um, the expanded seating issue or the, you know, the overuse of, of water and other facilities, to me, that's, that's an easy one. I don't think anyone's really expanded their restaurants right now. I mean, they're, they're struggling just to have the same number of people that used to be there. It's not my sense, and I could be wrong, that people have added tables. They've just moved a number of the tables outdoors they have a larger 
space indoors now that's not being used. As long as we don't allow more tables per establishment, but just allow them to use outdoor space as well as indoor space, that solves that problem. Um, the other issue, the, part, the only issue I see is it, we do have laws about minimum number of parking spaces required per certain square footage or types of establishments. And I guess we got to find a way around that. Um, you know, maybe we just have to bite the bullet and require less parking where there are restaurants, but I, I, that's something that needs to be figured out because this seems like a good change. And like Mickey was saying, you know, it's Southern California. Why shouldn't people be able to eat outdoors at more places? So it seems like we've actually stumbled into an, a good thing out of this, um, this otherwise bad thing. My connection seems to have frozen. I don't know if it froze at your end no. or just at my end. We, we, we can hear you and Mike, your, your okay. video is keeping up with your mouth. Okay, you guys all froze at my end. In any event, that's all I have to say. I, I, I agree with the proposal to just receive this and file it and take a harder look at it later. I, I think I think we're all in agreement. And uh, I too like the idea of uh, having more opportunities for outdoor dining in Malibu. Uh, for years, the, the Malibu seafood was one of my favorite places simply because it was you know, very relaxed, very outdoor. But it's been fun to eat in other places now that are outdoors as well. And I think if they've got the ability to have a few tables outdoors or even a bunch of tables outdoors, it's something that we should uh, figure out a way how to accommodate. So do we need a vote on this? They're the one receiving. question that was left open was on the 72 hours to vacate it if the emergency ends. I don't know that we, it doesn't seem like we're close to that, but clearly for the amount of money and expense these people went to, I think 72 hours is pretty much unrealistic to do that. So I, I don't know if we should, I, you know. I think we just need to let people know with as much lead time as possible that this is coming. And uh, hopefully we'll also have reached an agreement on some method of allowing some outdoor dining to remain before that point. But Bruce, I see your hand. Yeah, can we get the city attorney to just bring back a proposed amendment to the existing urgency ordinance to give people 30 days notice and then we have more than enough time to figure out what we're gonna do while that's in place? Sure, that's council's, sure. That's council's pleasure, happy to do it. Okay. Very good. I thought we had a motion from Council Member Fair, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe we could treat that as a friendly amendment to the motion. I accept. Do we have a second? I'll second if not. Okay. We got a motion and a second with a friendly amendment. So Kelsey, will you call the roll, please? Certainly. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Pearson? Yes. Council Member Uri? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Now we're at item 6A, where I imagine we'll be hearing from Rob DeBow about the fiscal year 2021 2022 capital improvements plan and update. Yes. Uh, uh, good evening, Council, and uh, I'm going to do my best. Uh, my voice is kind of going out. I'm, I've been sick all week. Um, Sorry so to hear that. I'm going to, I'm going to do my best here. Um, so, uh, uh, but tonight I'll, I'll be giving an update on the current capital improvement projects and the, also the disaster capital improvement projects. I have a, I have a lengthy presentation. I'm going to go over all of the projects kind of quickly. Um, then hopefully at the end, be available for a question at the end. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, um, our current work plan <clears throat> has 18 capital projects. Um, that total project cost comes out to be 95 million. Um, majority of that cost is Civic Center Wastewater Treatment Facility Phase 2, but um, that is that the total project cost for that. Uh, we also have 10 disaster recovery projects. Those equate out to about 5.3 million. Next slide. Um, we've since July 1st, we've we have actually completed 
a, a few projects here. I, I'm going to kind of go over them a, a little bit quickly in, in some following slides, but we've done a few capital projects, uh, um, com completed those, and a couple of uh, disaster capital projects. And uh, um, I'll, I'll go in detail on some of the slides in the following slides. Next slide. Um, here's our 2021 annual street maintenance project. This resurfaced um, a few streets within our within our city, mostly Malibu Road, uh, Latigo, Broad Beach, um, and we also did some speed humps on Birdview. Next slide. Um, this is Civic Center Way improvements. As you can know, as everyone knows, we did some street improvements on on Civic Center Way, um, the widen the road, lower the um, the crown of uh, Civic Center Way to make it to have a more visual kind of uh, safety measure for um, for for drivers on there. Did, did some other improvements on there, and so that's that project that was completed this year. Next slide. Um, this is a Civic Center stormwater diversion structure project. This was a, a you can see a concrete wall was placed in the, the existing concrete um, drain structure on Civic Center Way. This helped uh, um, divert water that goes in that storm drain into our trim facility, but it also helps from water that gets backed up from Malibu Creek and not entering into our system. So this is another safe measure that we that we put on here, um, especially before the storms happened here this last time. Uh, um, that really helped us kind of um, prevent all that backwater in, uh, um, from getting into our system. Next slide. Uh, uh, we also replaced the the roof over at City Hall. It's now it's a it's a um, it's a plastic kind of uh, resin type of roof that, that's placed on there. It's a it's a green roof that's um, water resistant and uh, it also reflects uh, um, um, the sunlight. Next slide. Uh, we've also after after the Wesley fire, we had several guardrails within the city, also within the county too. And the, the city and the county kind of teamed up together to replace um, a ton of guardrails within um, our area. And this this project um, did all that. There you can see a couple pictures here: one on Latigo, and this one mm, it looks like uh, looks like Latigo too. It's um, a couple of a couple on there, but yeah, we replaced. All, all the damaged guardrails. Next slide. And uh, this is uh, Malibu Park storm drain improvements. After the storms at the subsequent Wesley fire, we've had a lot of storm drain damage on within the neighborhood over in, in Malibu Park. Um, this project repaired a bunch of storm drains on there. So upcoming storms, we would have a, a functioning drainage system so we wouldn't have a whole lot of problems like we did after Wesley fire. Um, happy to report that these uh, storm drain improvements did help the upcoming storm, and they worked um, rather well. Next slide. Um, as you can see, this is a list of all of our capital projects we have in our design phase. Um, I've broken them down into capital projects and disaster capital um, disaster recovery capital projects. Um, quite a few we have on our books. Um, a lot of them take a, a substantial amount of time, coordination with different agencies, um, and, but I'll go over in each of them in detail. Next slide. This is a PCH median improvement. Uh, um, this project is replacing the median uh, on PCH from Webb Way to Puerco Canyon Road. Um, this project will replace the existing median with a with a stamped concrete median, very similar to what was been placed by Caltrans right in front of Malibu Seafood. Um, this project uses Measure R funds, and it's currently um, being finalized by Caltrans. We're, we're expecting this project to be ready to go sometime in March. Next slide. Um, this next project is PSAG signal um, system improvements. Um, I'm, I'm going to refer to my notes because I got this pretty good. So um, this project goes from Topanga Canyon to John Tyler. Um, the project will update 
the traffic signals along this section and, and signal and signalize the, the traffic lights. There's a bunch of new traffic sensors will be installed and, and they will detect traffic and um, adjust the, the uh, signal timing accordingly. So it's, it, it'll be a smart system that will be able to accommodate and, and change the timing um, dy dynamically based on traffic demand. Um, a couple things that I, I want to point out in, in this in this project too is that we are uh, uh, modifying the traffic signal um, right by Nobu. Uh, right now, it's a pedestrian um, crosswalk, and what we're doing is we're we're going to make that a full signalized intersection and adjust the signals and and walkway so we can have a dedicated left turn lane into um, Nobu. To, to help with the traffic in that area. Um, another part of this project that I, I am um, currently pulling out of it right now and, and getting more getting more information uh, or input from the from the committees is that um, it, this had several um, large permanent um, message boards along PCH and um, I, I got some input from the Public Works Commission that that might not be a good idea. They want to have a little bit more input and see what other options they have. Uh, um, they they thought that the uh, um, overhead signs make it more of a urbanized area, which I tend to agree. So we're looking at the different options that we can do in there, but we want to continue forward with the signalized project, but have that other part of it kind of uh, um, worked out within the next, um, uh, within this next year, we'll have something kind of to come back with council and, and I'll kind of uh, give an update on council on what the commission has come up with from some of the other ideas. Next slide. Um, these two photos that kind of show a little bit of kind of what um, the improvements will be done at, at those intersections, a, a lot of sensors and, and a lot of different modifications to the signals. Um, the lower right hand one is um, a, a illustration of the traffic signal modification that we're doing near near Nobu. Next slide. Next project is uh, Malibu, uh, or Mal it's the Marie Canyon Green Streets. Um, this project is going to install a pre-manufactured stormwater bio biofilter, and, and it's going to collect the stormwater from the Malibu Country Estates neighborhood. Uh, um, the stormwater will go in this filter. It, it will, this filter will, will, will remove bacteria that is found within the storm drain and return it back into the storm drain system and later discharge out into Murray Canyon. Um, this project was part of our, um, our, our regional bore stormwater permit. And um, we're, we're looking to finalize this design sometime during the spring and hopefully get this out sometime after that. Next slide. This is our Civic Center Water Treatment Facility Phase Two. <clears throat> this project um, ex expands the Civic Center Water Treatment Facility and Wastewater Collection System to uh, those properties that are shown as, as orange on the map, which is uh, um, the Malibu Colony, um, part, a portion of Sarah Retreat, and the condos off of Civic Center Way. Um, right now, this project is we're we're wrapping up the design of this project, uh, looking to to have this project um, go out to bid sometime in February. Um, we currently got a an extension from the regional board to a, to form the assessment district in late June, um, and with the successful. Um, assessment district formation. We look to probably start the construction later in the fall um, with all the properties within the orange sections required to connect to the system by November 5th, 2024. Next slide. This is our Westward Beach parking improvements. Um, a, a, as you know, I, I, I did a presentation um, for this for, for council. Uh, uh, we got direction to bring this item back to the Public Works and Public Safety Commission. Uh, we are looking to um, have a meeting. I believe it's uh, 
January 20th is that we're having a joint meeting where we'll be discussing this project, looking at different alternatives to um, to re report back to council and, and get further direction. So um, stay tuned for this one. I'll be coming back soon with, with some more information what the, what the Public Safety and Public Works Commission comes back with. Next slide. Um, next project is our uh, um, is our permanent skate park. The project will construct uh, a new uh, 12,500 square foot in-ground permanent skate park at Abu Bluffs Park. The project is currently under design and is anticipated to be completed in early um, this 2022. Um, the project design will be brought to the Planning Commission and City Council for a final review. Next slide. Hold on, I, I gotta drink some water. Okay. Um, Malibu uh, Bluffs Park shade structure. This project will, will be adding four um, shade structures to to the facility. Two over at the playground um, area, and then two at the at the baseball picnic area. Um, this project is currently under design, and we're anticipating being done by early spring. <coughs> Next slide. Uh, vehicle protection devices. Uh, this is a, a baller type um, structure that will be placing within the city's right of way. Um, and it's, it's, it's uh, being meant to comply with the city's municipal code regarding vehicle impact uh, protection devices for parking areas located adjacent, adjacent to outdoor parking um seating areas um here we have a situation our first location is in front of uh, Traverna Tony's uh, um this location has uh outdoor patio and an entrance there right right in front of uh, um city parking so the thought is there is to place some baller types uh, um in those few parking areas right there next slide The other location is at the uh, Malibu Animal Hospital. The city owns this property, um, but right in front of uh, the where the parking is, right where the arrow is, is a, an area where there's outdoor seating and people sit out there. And so to protect those people, we're, we're, we will put some more ball, we'll put a couple of ballers at that location. Um, this project is um, in, in design, and once again, we're, we're looking probably spring, summer um, to have this completed. Next slide. Legacy Park paver repairs. Um, this project, it, uh, we, had, we, we have noticed uh, several pavers out in, in Malibu Legacy Park that have been buckling and coming apart. Um, uh, maintenance staff and park staff has gone out there and replaced some of these um, uh, damaged pavers. And so right now, I, I think that, that those repairs have satisfied this, this project, but we're going to further evaluate it and, and look to see if we need to do um, a, a further uh, expansion on this project. And, and, and I'll be looking at this to probably see if we need to do it for the next upcoming budget. Next, next slide. Malibu Bluffs Park South uh, Walkway Repairs. Uh, um, the, the existing concrete walkway on the south side of the park is, is damaged. The concrete is broken up. Um, this project will go through and actually remove those concrete sections and replace those sections with, with new concrete. Um, let's see, we are... Um, looking to kind of have this project done sometime during the summer and possibly going out to construction or early fall winter. Next slide. Um, Trancas Park uh, playground surfacing. This project is replacing the existing playground surface over at, at uh, Trancas Park. Uh, um, once again, we are going to be working on this project and we're looking to probably have this project out uh, and complete in uh, design completed in, in sometime during the summer. Next. 
Um, this next project, PCH uh, crosswalk improvements at Big Rock Drive in 20326 PCH. This is a Measure M project that I, I, I believe I talked about uh, uh, giving a presentation to the council a, a while ago. This project will add raised medians at a PCH and, and Big Rock and, and also put um, overhead flashing beacons that's a, um, that, that warn traffic there's a signal ahead. Next slide. And this is an illustration of the proposed improvements at 20326 PCH, which is right in front of Moon Shadows. This is another raised median uh, um, that is being planned over here. Also, too, there is additional flashing beacons that will say um, pedestrian crossing. Next slide. Next project is another Measure M project. It's it's a um, PCH median improvement project at Paradise Cove and Zuma Beach. <coughs> this project will add, add additional raised median on PCH at Paradise Cove. <laughs> and uh, next slide. And also, um, it, it will do it'll add, add another raised medians on, on PCH adjacent to Zuma Beach. Uh, um, we, we are, uh, this is the, like I said, this is the measure M project. We are planning to start this design project sometime during the spring. Uh, we are, we'll, we'll look to have a consultant to help us to try to get this project designed. Next slide. Um, PCH intersection improvements at Trancas Canyon Road. Uh, this project will add in a new right turn lane to westbound uh, traffic on PCH before you get to Trancas Canyon um, Road. Um, this will help with traffic turning left on, on Trancas Canyon and also turning, or I'm, I'm sorry, turning right into Trancas Canyon and, but, and also turning right into the shopping center. Right now there isn't a dedicated right turn lane. And so traffic will um, has to turn right in, into the number two lane, um, which causes quite a traffic safety concern. Um, we have selected a traffic consultant to actually help with the design of this project. Um, plan on bringing that that contract um, to city council probably in February, and get started run in uh, starting the design on the design right away. Next slide. Okay, <laughs> the next next set of slides are our projects that we have for our disaster repair projects. Um, this first project is Clover Heights Storm Drain Improvements. Um, this is a hazard mitigation grant that we received from FEMA um, to help to help relieve um, uh, storm storm drain or storm water or at, or other hazards that happen during during the floods. Uh, what happened at this at the intersection of Harvester and Clover Heights? Um, a large amount of mud and debris came down through the section and, and we were constantly have to have crews out there to clean up the area. Uh, um, Clover Heights at the end of the cul-de-sac, we've had big retaining walls or, or big um, K rails and mud and debris over three feet, at least over three feet filled up the end of the cul-de-sac and, and actually flowed over and into uh, um, in, into uh, the school. And so this new, this new storm drain will help alleviate that problem and we'll get the storm water going in, into a underground storm drain system and prevent further erosion and, and uh, debris going in the streets. Um, we are currently uh, working on um, getting a consultant on, on board. We're looking to have that out probably within the next couple of months and get started on, on that design. Next slide. Um, Latigo Canyon Road retaining wall repairs. Um, there's a series of retaining walls on Latigo Canyon Road. Uh, a lot of them are metal beam uh, retaining walls that had wood lagging. And uh, during the Woosley fire, those all got burnt out and um, caused me great concern. And we went out right away after the Woosley fire and put this metal um, shoring sheets behind the um, 
a, a, a metal beam so we can shore up and keep keep Latigo from falling. Um, this project will repair the repair these these uh, retaining walls and put in non-flammable material within the the metal beams and, and rebuild that that retaining wall. Um, this project is about 95% completed and we're just doing the final touches on it and hopefully we'll have this out and ready to bid within the next couple of months. Next slide. <clears throat> Trancas Canyon Park repairs. Uh, uh, we had several several items that were damaged during the Woosley fire at the Trancas Park. Um, a lot of the irrigation and planning was, was damaged. Our septic system was damaged. And then also uh, we received um, a lot of damage through the slope that goes that goes um, between the park and um, Malibu Park um, or Malibu West. Uh, um, that was damaged. A, a lot of the concrete swales that are on that slope were really damaged, and everything. And um, especially after the subsequent rains. So, so this project um, will make all those repairs to to those facilities. Um, uh, the septic system at Trancas Park was actually repaired. We got that done. We, we fast tracked that, that part of the project and got that repaired. Um, and, and now we're we're finalizing the the slope repair and the um, irrigation and planting repair that's done over there. We're looking to have this done probably within the next couple of months, and then get started on construction on that one. Next slide. <coughs> Broad Beach Road or water quality uh, repairs. Um, I believe uh, uh, several years ago we we installed nine um, pre-manufactured biofilters on Broad Beach Road, and, and this was done to be in compliance with our stormwater permit, and, and also with the, um, um, a lawsuit with the with the Baykeeper. Stormwater on Broad Beach Road goes into these. Storm drain facilities, um, bacteria is is um, filtered out with, within these within these filters, and then it's discharged out into out into Broad Beach. Um, during the storms after the Wesley fire, massive amount of mud and debris came down and um, filled up and damaged the media that was in these uh, um, pre-manufactured um, biofilters. And so this project will go through and uh, remove the pre-manufactured media. We'll, we'll go in and, and place in new uh, pre-manufactured media and restore um, the functionality of, of these of these units. Um, this project is, we're probably a month away from getting this completed and we'll be looking to kind of get this out, um, out to bid too. Next slide. Incidental canyon repair. Um, there's some erosion um, um, issues, and, and, and it's shown in those red areas there. There's some minor erosion on, on the slide on the side of the the road there that um, this project will actually go and fix. And I think I have another slide. Um, next slide. Oh no, I don't. So um, going back to you know to incidental, there's there's some minor minor repairs that we're going to do on that project. We're um, kind of uh, trying to free, free up some time to have some 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 of our engineers kind of work on that. Uh, um, this we're keeping an eye on it to make sure no further erosion is, is happening in this area. And we have our maintenance crews kind of making sure nothing happens. But we have uh, um, we have some FEMA funds and Cal OES funds to actually make those repairs. We're just trying to get staff time to actually make them happen. Next slide. Um, this next project is Malibu slope, slope repairs. <coughs> this project includes repairing the existing slope adjacent to the stairs at 24712 Malibu Road. Um, this project was uh, uh, um, af after the storms from, from Wesley once again, had um, a, a little bit of erosion at this location. Uh, the roadway kind of uh, um, got eroded a little bit, and we're planning to actually make those repairs. Um, the project is 
currently at under design and we're looking to complete the design by um, the spring. Next slide. Um, the, this project is Westward Beach uh, Road shoulder shoulder repairs. This project actually uh, um, is uh, uh, is a result of a, the storms after Woosley. Um, the shoulder area on on Westward Beach got damaged, and this project will make those repairs on Westward Beach. Uh, this project is um, anticipated to start this project sometime this summer, and uh, or um, um, have have the, have the design completed by the summer. Next one. And uh, my last project is outdoor warning sirens. Um, as you know, um, council council awarded a contract with a design consultant to actually look at designs of, of putting in an outdoor warning sign. Uh, um, the consultant will finalize design and present that to city council. Um, with that, that is all the projects that we're working on. Um, I'll be happy to kind of answer to the questions that you guys have. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Mikey, I see your hand. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor uh, if I could just note for you, you don't have any public speakers for this item. Once again, you've saved me, Kelsey. Thank you. Um, Rob, I am so impressed that you got through that. I know you're not feeling well. And, Mikey, uh, Mikey, wait a minute. I see Ryan has raised his hand. Uh, Ryan? Okay, so late hands raised, right that what changes the order. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. I thought I did submit for this item, and that's why I've waited this meeting uh, at this point. But um, thank you for the raised hand. I think that works very well. Um, I wanted to um, expound on the MOU that the city is in with Caltrans, which um, has over the course of the city's history become a worse and a worse deal. And it's been very late at night, such as like tonight, when some thing gets presented as a boilerplate and just sign here. And we got at the last go around roped in to the entire cost of the capital replacement of traffic signals on Pacific Coast Highway based on a percentage of how many intersecting uh, streets we have, whether it's one or two. And <clears throat> that is a problem and it's a voluntary thing anyway. We could, uh, you know, rescind our MOU, but that brings up the point of traffic signals that are put in against the better judgment of the city of Malibu. For instance, the deal the Coastal Commission decided to make for um, coastal access near, I guess, Malibu uh, Inn. Um, that I, well, I, traffic signal is a pedestrian signal identified and disclosed by staff here tonight that that's going to be upgraded to a full traffic signal and and we're and Nobu's going to be so happy that people all they have to do is roll up and then they can turn left and come in and eat and they'll be able to leave real quick and everybody else on PCH is going to have to stop by the way so um we need to make sure that the city taxpayers are not funding the business plan of Nobu and that their nuisance and their 10 years of violating parking issues does not become an operational and a future cost to the city. And they're, um, they need to have be roped into a settlement agreement to be the co-funder for their traffic signal with Caltrans, that they pay for the electricity for it, not the city. And that the city not have to pay Caltrans for the maintenance and upgrades in the future of that signal and such as is occurring under this program. I hope we're not paying for this, that your policy 31 is that we recover costs and that we don't give a subsidy to this business district that doesn't need it on PCH for these facility upgrades. The traffic signals are a two-edged sword, and when they fail, and they do, such as the traffic sensor loops that have at Duke's restaurant in the distant past, 
where it looked like 10,000 cars were coming out of the Duke's parking lot and they were stopping up all the traffic on PCH. So this, the idea of adding a traffic signal comes with risk. Ryan, so thank you very much. Time. Thank you, Ryan. And Mayor, I don't see any other raised hands from the public, so that concludes public comments. Mikey, will you forgive me? Of course, no, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanna once again, get back to Rob and uh, um, thank you for hanging in there. I was in, an, I, it's really a mind blowing, like huge amount of public works projects. It really is. And your you and your staff's ability to oversee and execute those is, I find it stunning. Um, a couple of comments. I, it's really notable to me that the storm drain fixes at Malibu Park. I know there's still Clover Heights to go, but what a difference. Um, I mean, boy, oh boy, was that place a mess last time we had a massive rain. I mean, a mess. I don't know how Clover Heights fared this time, but I've been riding my bike around there. I didn't, I didn't see anything that caught my eye that much. So it can't have been as bad as last time, which was a disaster. So well done there. Is the right turn lane at Trancus is that, does that have to be tied to the bridge project or is it, can it be done separately? Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just curious. Well, it looks like it comes right up to the bridge project. Yeah, we, yeah, we coordinate a lot with, with, the, with their bridge design and we're kind of coordinating timing wise on when we can do it and everything too. So there has been a lot of coordination between us and Caltrans on this. They've actually already kind of looked at our concept before we got to this point and, and, and kind of, you know, green, green tagged it already saying, yeah, this, this looks good and to move forward with it. So, so yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, a short one. I had never known that the road that went into Trancas Park was called Del Mar Azul Drive. I, I bet I can win every trivia contest and with anyone in Malibu on that one. I'd never heard that in my entire life from anybody. Yeah. Um, and my big question really is, you didn't spend much time on it, but phase two of the sewer treatment plant is a monster project. And I know there's been, as I've been at the meetings, <laughs> I know there's been, it's hard. It's going hard with the neighborhood. Do, can you update us on on that part or, or whatever parts of it? Cause it just seems like this is a heavy lift. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, so currently right now, um, the next part of, 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 of actually this project is, is actually forming the assessment district. And, and in order to do that, um, one of the requirements is that we have to have, make sure that for actually be able to place all the improvements within the public right of way or within a easement that is uh, granted over to the city. Um, right now, there's a majority of uh, the project is, is in either is in Sarah or is in the colony. Those are both private air, private areas, and, and so we need easements from those property owners to do that. And, and so we've been coordinating, we've been talking, we've been trying to um, schedule meetings and get the word and, and move along with them and everything. We've made a, a lot of good progress on majority of them, but there's still a handful that are kind of out there that um, if we don't get these easements by a certain amount of time, it could jeopardize our overall schedule. So that's the next phase. Um, um, there is some other funding stuff. I'll, I'll be, I, I, I think a better approach maybe would be to maybe have a separate item bring out the council for this project because it's there's a lot to it. And for me to kind of give you the five minute intro or to synapse right now would be kind of a disjustice for it and kind of I, I'd, I'd rather have more time to dedicated to give um, the council really an update and kind of, you know, data dump from my brain or you guys can know exactly what's kind of going on from my standpoint. Thank you. That, that's, that's a great idea. Thank you very much, Rob. 
Okay, Bruce, you're first in line. Okay, well, Rob, I just wanna thank you for that presentation. There's a lot there to digest. It's actually really impressive to see all that work that's going on. So um, I may have some specific questions about some of the specific projects, but there's no reason to waste the councils or the public's time asking them right now. I could just talk to you offline. So thanks yeah. for the presentation, appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, no problem. Steve? Yeah, Rob, uh, again, I'll, I'll like everybody else. Thank you for the presentation. It's a lot of stuff to go through, especially when you're not feeling well. So thank you very much. Well, I, I mean, I'm feeling well. It's just, it's, <laughs> I, I sound like hell. You don't sound well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I sound like hell. Uh, just, you know, and, and I'm just, I was just going to comment your your suggestion to hold a separate meeting on the wastewater treatment system, I think is a good one. And I yeah. think the biggest issue I'm hearing from people right now is can we get some funding, some low, you know, interest that that seems to when I walk through Sarah Canyon, that's what people ask me about. Yeah. So uh, yeah. having a separate meeting, that we can go through some of that, I think would be very helpful. So thank right. you very much. Go home and get better. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Karen? Yeah, Rob, I just want to thank you also. I know this is a huge amount of work and uh, we all appreciate it. Um, I'm very happy to hear that right turn lane is going in. It's been a long time in coming. Um, and yeah, the, the Clover Heights storm drain is, is a huge thing. It's been, like Mikey said, it's just been a disaster after the big rains and I know Everybody at Malibu High is going to be happy about that too, along with the neighbors. So um, just thank you very much and hope you feel and sound better soon. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, a, a couple of things that I, I wanted to point out too is, is <clears throat> during the next budget, um, the upcoming budget, I, I am going to have an, another part of the presentation of the budget being the upcoming capital project work plan. And you guys can see what our work plan is um, for for this next coming year and, and make comments and make suggestions and um, whatnot and kind of let me know if if there are certain things you want to move around and do things and so that's part of what um, I'm kind of gearing up everybody in council and kind of letting what's kind of going on. Um, Another thing that I'm planning on doing is maybe during a consent item is kind of give council kind of an update throughout part of the year and kind of let everybody know kind of where we are within the projects. And so, you know, oh, yeah, I remember that project. This is coming. And so just a, a consent item, you can kind of see informational, see what where we are in some of these projects. And so I'm planning to doing that more often. Um, if this is helpful kind of going over more and detailing some of these ones, I'll, I'll be happy to do that. Maybe maybe once a year, maybe not all the time, but maybe once a year. If, 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 I'm just kind of getting some more feedback. Does that seem a good, like a good approach? I, I think we all agree that, that, that we would like to remain informed. I don't think we need to have it at every meeting, but I, and I do agree with the others that we do need a special meeting to bring us up to date on where we are with the uh with this second phase of the uh the sewer plan and thank you again for all your work so i think it will not be difficult for me to find somebody to make a motion to receive and file this update i'll make that motion i'll second it Okay, we have a motion and a second to receive and file the update of the fiscal year 2021-2022 capital improvement plan. Kelsey, will you take the roll, please? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Urain? Yes. Motion carries. Motion to adjourn. Uh-huh. We have several motions to adjourn. Shall we take the roll, Kelsey? It could be Steve's motion. Steve's okay. motion, Bruce's uh, simultaneous second. Excellent. Councilmember Urine? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. And I motion hope carries. everyone has a lovely evening. Good night. Thank Adios, you. guys. Thank you. Thank you.